And yes, it's on um, with the recording. Thank you very much, Christy. Okay. okay, okay, bye. Bye. All right, so now that we have sorted that out, I can begin my opening remarks and we will do our official start here of the... <clears throat> <clears throat> of today's session on procurement. So once. Okay. Right. So good afternoon, everyone. I am Kamla Rampasad de Silva, Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to our second session of the procurement series for 2023. We had a really great start to this series. We looked at some of the implications of the off report last month with Afra Raymond from Trinidad and Tobago, Michael Boucher from the UK, and John Dows, who is currently in Canada and who today is serving as our moderator for the second panel discussion. Today, we are joined by three very experienced persons from the construction sector who would be looking at the report and some concerns that they have for the construction industry. To those of you who are new or joining us for the first time, I wanted to share that the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute is a nonprofit membership organization. And we welcome everyone who wishes to join in our purpose of improving corporate governance practices in the region. Since the start of the year, we've welcomed two new corporate members, as well as several individual members. So today our membership reflects persons from Jamaica, Barbados, St. Lucia, Guyana, the British Virgin Islands, St. Martin, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and of course, Trinidad and Tobago. As a member, you get to attend some of our sessions free of charge, as well as at discounted rates for our paid sessions. So for instance, tomorrow we begin our lessons from the boardroom series. This year we have uh, Rochelle Cameron from Jamaica, Jonathan Yearwood from Guyana, and Margaret Ann DePisa from Trinidad and Tobago, who will be sharing on their experiences. You may be very interested in our panel discussion on chat GPT and its implications for businesses, which will be held on April 4th. We have an exciting lineup of speakers, including journalist Tony Dial, robotics engineer Vijay Pradeep, Hermat President Cavell Joseph Santome, and US compliance expert Susanna Sierra. For those of you who may not be aware, ChatGPT is an AI software that is considered a real game changer for the world. So we need to be quite aware of how it is evolving and its likely impact on our businesses and activities. <clears throat> Later this year, Howard Duckman will be returning with our financial stewardship workshop. And I want to encourage everyone to please register for this. Many of us are not versed in financial statements and it hampers our ability to provide the oversight that is required from us as senior managers and board members. Howard is an extremely effective facilitator who has a passion for finance and so his workshops are always very engaging. The session would be on July 19th. We also have a, a repeat workshop on the effectiveness of the audit committee, which will be delivered next month by Janita John, who is from South Africa and former head of Global IIA. And of course, our signature event, which is Governance Week, will be held from June 25th to 30th this year. And our theme is a circular world, governing for future generations. We are delighted to share that the opening keynote will be delivered by Nandi Mandela, who is the granddaughter of Nelson Mandela. So I invite you to, to check out our website, register, become a member with us, because lots of exciting things are happening, which will include today's workshop. So just before we get into it, I'd like to um, do a few quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, First, we'd like to ask everyone to ensure that their names are correctly captured on the screen. Uh, this is because, as I explained a short while ago, we are in a virtual room together, which allows uh, each of us to engage freely with the other participants. 
So it is important we ensure that everyone is easily identifiable. Also, we'd like to ask everyone to keep their microphones on mute throughout the session. During the speaker's presentations, if you wish to make a comment or ask a question, please raise your hand using the icon at the bottom of the screen. When invited by the moderator, you would please unmute yourself and please press the mute icon again as soon as you are done in order to minimize any disruptive noises. And of course, you can also make comments or ask questions in the chat feature during the session. Those of you who need to earn CPDs or PDUs as part of your ongoing certification, you may use uh, these sessions to claim your points. However, you need to email us first to request the certificate, and then we will respond after verifying your attendance at the session. And this also speaks to why it is important you are properly identified, because we can only issue these points if we know that you were present. <clears throat> Finally, towards the end of the session, we will put up a survey link to get your feedback. We would appreciate if you will take two minutes of your time and share with us your thoughts on today's sessions. This is extremely important for us because helps, it helps us to be able to plan um, and meet your needs. So now as we move to today's session, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, who in turn will then introduce our panelists as he take over um, the session. Our moderator is John Douse, who is a senior managing director with Ankura Consultant Group. Possessing qualifications in both construction and law, John has some 40 years of industry and consulting experience gained in regions as diverse as the UK, Europe, the Middle East, the Caribbean, and North America, and in the procurement and delivery of complex construction projects up to several billion dollars in value. So everyone would have been sent um, a copy of the agenda. In fact, I will put it in the chat for you as well. So you'll get detailed information on the background of everyone. Um, I'm just happy to say John um, has worked in the region, um, has been based here in Trinidad and Tobago, where he spent some 11 years or so. Um, support and work in the Caribbean region. Um, and now he works out of uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, John has been a past uh, panelist for sessions here at CCGI, and he's someone whose expertise we tremendously value. And I'm very happy that he has agreed to be our moderator for today's panel discussion. John, I welcome you to the, the virtual um, microphone and pass over today's session to you. Thank you very much, Kamala. It's a pleasure to be here today to uh, to moderate this panel discussion, which I think is going to be very lively over the next couple of hours. <clears throat> excuse me. I think I've caught Kamala's cough in the last few minutes, so please excuse me. Uh, the subject of today's discussion is getting construction right, recommendations from the UF report. Uh, it falls under the CCGI's procurement series of lectures. But when we are talking about procurement in this context, we're talking not only about the legal act of forming contracts to uh, procure, to, to uh, develop assets and to gain assets, but we're talking about the delivery methods as well. And the, the report, which is colloquially known as the UF report, was a report into the construction sector of Trinidad and Tobago. It was in 2010. Uh, I was in Trinidad both for a few years before that and for 10 years after the report. So, uh, And I actually had personal involvement in some of the projects which the Commission of Enquiry considered. It was a wide ranging report. It made what, 91 recommendations as to how the industry might review its own practices with the hopes of, of development and of implementing uh, international standards of practice, serving the industry, bringing integrity to the industry to raise public confidence in the way that government money was spent as well. 
Joining me today, I'm excited to have three prominent industry guests. Firstly, we have Mr. Adesh Surajnath. Uh, Adesh is currently the head of Civil Projects Division at Trinterplan Consultants in Trinidad and Tobago. He has approximately 27 years of experience in both civil and geotechnical engineering projects, including various types of civil engineering projects covering infrastructure development and industrial projects. His involvement in projects includes the supervision of the construction of civil and structural works in a new ammonia plant, construction of road infrastructure, field drilling geotechnical operations, laboratory testing, including soils, concrete and asphalt, and in carrying out engineering analysis and and analyses and writing design reports. Prior to his work at Trinterplan, Adesh also carried out structural design and review of structural designs for a number of buildings. Adesh, welcome to today's panel. Secondly, I'd like to welcome Derek Outridge. Derek is a chartered surveyor, an RICS registered valuer, attorney at law, arbitrator, registered mediator, and a part-time senior lecturer at the University of the West Indies, Trinidad campus. Derek has over 42 years of experience in the construction industries of Trinidad and Tobago, the United Kingdom, and the Caribbean region. He is extremely academically qualified as well as professionally and practically qualified. Derek obtained his Bachelor of Science in Quantity Surveying. He is a professional associate of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. He's a full member of the Institute of Surveyors of Trinidad and Tobago a project management professional with the Project Management Institute uh, in the US. He holds a Master of Philosophy degree in surveying and land information. He's a fellow of the Quantity Surveyors Institute in the United Kingdom, holds a postgraduate diploma of law from the University of Huddersfield, is an associate member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, holds a postgraduate certificate in in professional legal practice I became tongue-tied there, my apologies, holds a certificate of enrollment and an, is an attorney at law in the Trinidad and Tobago Bar. He is a member of the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago, a certified non-family mediator with the Mediation Board of Trinidad and Tobago, and an honorary member of the Construction Management Institution of Trinidad and Tobago. Derek, welcome to today's panel. We look forward to hearing from you. Our third panelist, who who I have recently had the opportunity of speaking with and also watching some of his broadcasts on uh, live feed TV, is Dr. Don Samuel. Don has 21 years of industry experience, including 11 years at senior management level. His expertise is in the fields of construction procurement, project management, construction management and facilities management. He's managed some 200 civil engineering projects with a net value of over 500 million TT dollars, over 73 million US dollars. Past responsibilities have included design, construction and maintenance of buildings, drainage systems, sewer systems, major roads, highways, residential and development, civil engineering infrastructure. And his current responsibilities include facilities management of the University of Tobago, uh, Trinidad and Tobago's, sorry, the University of the West Indies, 70 buildings, 60 houses, and six satellite sites. He's lectured for four years in the MBA program for the Australian Institute of Business and has 13 years of research experience. His current research gate interest score is 27.1 with 3,700 and 96 reads of six articles, five published and one unpublished. He has a number of citations and recommendations also. Academically, Don holds a a bachelor degree in civil engineering, a master's degree in construction management and a doctorate in construction management. He's a professional member of the Project Management Institute, the Institution of Civil Engineers and Chartered Institute uh, and Chartered Management Institute, and is licensed to practice civil engineering in Trinidad and Tobago and the United Kingdom. He's currently tenured also with the University of the West Indies. Don, welcome to the panel. We look forward to hearing from you. 
Today, we would like to make this discussion interactive as well. It's not just here for the panel to give their opinions on the industry. Uh, we're not intending to be critical of any aspect of the industry. This is to promote development in the section of both government procurement and the process of delivery of every capital expenditure project. We'd like to hear from you, the audience. We'd like you to post questions in the, uh, in the chat room if you can. I will be monitoring that as we go through. And also, if you have questions which you'd like to ask live, on air, as it were, then please, as Kamala has indicated, put your hand up and we will, uh, we will take your question then. There will be a question and answer session at the end, but any questions that you want to raise beforehand, we're welcome to hear them and I'll certainly try and incorporate them. To kick off, I'd like to ask a question and this is open. Uh, I'll let each panelist speak uh, to it on the, each of the first two points I have to raise and I'll let them speak individually. My first point though, my first question is the off report from 2020, 2010 was commissioned at a time when there was significant publicity over the performance of the procurement and delivery of a number of high profile government sponsored projects. In short, the projects were perceived as failing for a number of reasons. The Scarborough Hospital and the Brian Lara Stadium projects were just two of many projects considered. Now we're 13 years on since the Commission of Enquiry report, and there have been a number of other high profile projects which have drawn significant attention in the media and in the courts. Question I'd like to ask the panel, and I, we will kick off with Anesh if we can, please. Does the panel consider that anything has changed since the procurement, since the publication of the Commission of Enquiry report, the UF report? Adesh, over, you, over to you, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, in terms of anything has changed, I would say there have been some um, implementation of some of the recommendations. Uh, one of them was, I think, um, just to give an example, state enterprises are holding their contractors and their consultants to, to a greater level of accountability in that where there are errors, that typical errors on the consultant part, some state, well, certain state enterprises are enforcing some sort of um, damages, damages on, um, on the consultant. And in the same vein, in terms of the construction, where the, where the contractor has gone past the established time for completion, they are in, they, they, the state enterprises are ensuring that they're enforcing the delay damages clause in the, in, in the condition of the contract. Um, that that's uh, that is basically when I when I went when I went through the the op report in terms of the recommendations that's the main thing I would have seen that has changed. But a lot of the other recommendations, there has been very little um, progression in implementing those recommendations. Thank you, uh, Derek. Anything you would like to add to that? Uh, yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Um, and John, I'm very happy to see that we have decided to make the team getting construction right. Um, there, there have been, I have looked at the, the 91 recommendations in the of inquiry. And um, we have had uh, research students at the University of the West Indies investigate significantly into several of these recommendations. And we have two researchers who actually took all of the 91 recommendations and, and classify them into 17 categories. And, you know, in respect of um, whether there's been improvement in designs, no, I didn't see any. Whether there's been any improvement in construction oversight, in fact, there's less construction oversight by independent consultants. Whether there's been any construct improvements in construction project management, I've not seen any. Whether there's been um, improvement with the statutory authorities um, in terms of giving approvals uh, prior to construction start, there has been some aspects of that. And, and, and that is driven by both your people having to get a CEC before 
uh, construction and then and then turn up and country planning granting the authority and, and everything else happening after that. Um, whether there's been value for money, no, I'm not seeing that. There, there are less involvement of the cost consultant in um, in the aspect of getting value for money. You know, there's been a significant amount of waste still happening on the construction project. Whether there, there's been any improvement in procurement, well, I will leave that to Don because uh, the Procurement Act, it hasn't yet been um, you know, put into effect, but it's hopefully it's heading there, right? The bonds and insurances, yes, they are, they are in place now, you know, Site matters, I am seeing more and more site investigations uh, being requested, and that's a very good thing, right? Key performance indices uh, for construction um, project success, I am not seeing that. That has, is not being done by the state organizations. Dispute resolution, there's been some movement in dispute resolution. I, I am not of the view that it has, it has gone anywhere because there's been no revision to the arbitration laws. You know, there has been some movements to, to mediation. There's nothing on statutory adjudication. So we haven't gone anywhere with that. Corruption, there is no improvement in corruption. Transparency, I am not of the view that we're transparent without good procurement legislation. Delay damages, and I agree with, with uh, Adesh, there has been some improvement in that. Contractor selection, it still has not improved. Stakeholder um, involvement on the projects, there have been some improvement with stakeholder consultation as a virtue of the CEC. And the last one, local content. You, well, <coughs> there is local content in the energy sector but I'm not seeing a significant amount in the construction sector. And those are the 17 categories that I, 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 I have said that um, was categorized and um, I have addressed it like that. Well, thank you very much, Derek. Um, Don, both uh, Adesh and Derek seem to be indicating that uh, there has been movement, but it's baby steps at the moment. Uh, I'm aware that you are a strong advocate of procurement legislation leading the way on this. Um, are we going to, you know, can you give a comment on your perspective at the moment, recognizing that the government has taken steps towards enactment, but hasn't yet been so brave as to uh, publicly enact the bill? Uh, is it something which is needed? Is it, a, or should the industry be driven at ground level by the practitioners within the industry as well. Your, co your comments, please, your thoughts. <laughs> yes, thank you, John, and thank you, Adish and Derek. I mean, I always call this team of um, Don, Adish, and Derek as the Avengers team of the industry. And the reason why we call ourselves that is because we've been advocating, as you rightly said, for quite a long time. I think Derek has been in it more than all of us, and, I, I totally support what good Adish and Derek is saying as a characterization of the industry at this point in time. The issues, so, so I'm not going to repeat anything that I said. I guess we'll discuss it and we'll talk deal into it as we go along. But what I want to um, highlight in the procurement side, and um, I will say that I'm, I'm an advocate for construction procurement because I'm not an expert in all procurement. So, you know, I need to declare that. So as an advocate for construction procurement, um, one of the, I have five concerns. And the first of that is the fact at this point in time, we don't have a procurement regulator appointed. And um, I know the regulator well, he's a very upstanding person. And um, I think that um, his contract probably was not renewed in January. And since then, we have not seen our uh, procurement regulator. So I am a, I'm wondering what is gonna happen between that time and when they do appoint one. Um, so that's one. And then, of course, as he alluded to, the Public Procurement and Disposal Public Property Act um, has not been um, yet uh, proclaimed by the president. Well, the last one, I know we have a new president. And I think we all know the issues around that, so I'm not going to delve into too much of that. But what I would say is, and, and it's something to dovetail off of Derek's comment, is that where's the oversight? Okay, we, One of the things that the off-report recommended 
So I have to be fair that some things, as Adesh and Derek is saying, some things have been done, but a lot still needs to be done. And the question is that you asked was who should drive it? And I am all for the industry driving it. I'm not hearing too many of the uh, industry advocates um, come out and say, here's what we need to improve ourselves. And when, when a few of them do, including um, Adesh, um, Derek and myself, seem to fall on their face. Um, Something else that is very particular concern to me in procurement is that, you know, last year the Integrity Commission indicated that there were about over a thousand ex parte applications made to the High Court for persons who did not file declarations. This is very important from the standpoint of, of transparency. If we if persons are serving as directors and they don't declare, and then there's a there, it could be a suspicious nature of their operations, and we don't want to single out anybody, as we say. But this is very significant and, and wonder how could oversight happen. In terms of value for money, which both Derek and Addis spoke about, you know, some of the simplest things we've been taught in the construction um, degrees, whether the bachelor's, master's, or the doctorate level, is that where's the feasibility studies for projects? Because it seems to be that projects are being executed with political expediency. And I don't want to get too much into it, obviously. I'm mindful of that people um, vote one way or the other. But we need to do projects uh, based on feasibility and not for political expediency. So in terms of, um, as I say, I'm an advocate for construction and procurement. I mean, my, I just, just make it a little plug here. Uh, my research had to do with um, coming up with a new tender evaluation tool, which I'm currently testing in industry. So I, am, I mean, data has always been slow for this type of research. So when I ask persons, some persons will give me data, some persons are resistant to give data. And um, Derek spoke about that. They are, they are, he, he has supervised research students who have done a lot of good work, a lot of good research, but we need to take the research and get it into the actual governance of the country because then what's the point of the research? So there's more I could say, but I want to just um, be mindful of time and, and respectful of my colleagues as well. So I'll hold for there now. That's, yeah, that's a great introduction. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dom. Um, and I, it leads me to my next point. The, the off report, the Commission of Inquiry report, call it as you will, did make a number of recommendations. And those recommendations were directed variously towards the government, the state-owned enterprises through which the government procures capital expenditure projects, and the industry at large, the contractors, the suppliers, the, uh, the consultants, the consultant organizations, the, the professional organizations as well. If you were to pick five, and we'll, whilst you're on camera, Don, we'll stick with you for this and then move back to our colleagues. If you were to pick five issues from the OFF report, which you think should be a priority to be addressed, which would those be? So sure, thank you very much for that consideration. Um, well, let's go with recommendation number one. <laughs> Recommendation one, and I'm quoting directly, is money assigned for public construction projects must not be allowed to be corruptly diluted and therefore stolen from the public. Now, bear in mind that there's an amendment. If you go to the parliament website of Rand Vigo and you go into Bill Essentials, you'll see that they talk about clause five, a bench section seven of the act. And this caused great debate and discourse in the public um, eye that uh, the act shall not apply, not apply, the public bodies who are in legal services, financial, accounting, audited, medical, and the last one, which is of great concern, such other services as the minister may by order determine. So that is the act. That, to, to me, my opinion on that is that it violates the first recommendation because then the minister, anyway, they don't say which minister, but I am assuming it's the minister of finance. Um, the minister may very well say, here's what, this project, we're not gonna apply the act to it. And um, it was within his right to do it once the recommendation, when, once the amendment is proclaimed. Sorry, once the whole bill in its entirety is proclaimed. So that's point number one for me, one of the first recommendations, and you asked me for five. Let's go to recommendation number two. Management rules should be performed only by experienced persons who should be motivated to take positive and proactive decisions and to take the initiative when the project so demands. Um, both Arish and um, Derek alluded there are allegations in the public eye. I'm not going to call any names of any 
state agencies, obviously, where we've, and you always think on the social media, you know, the typical comment of square pegs in a round hole, right? That's it, that's it, palance that we use here. But there have been allegations that inexperienced, unqualified persons have been hired to undertake procurement management, contract management, and so on. Now, of course, both universities, University of West Indies, University of Toronto, maybe we are producing graduates. So when I see this is happening, why are we not getting the right people to make the right decisions at the right time? That's that's a statement I always use. Get the right people to make the right decisions at the right time. So that is that is point number two. And of case, let me just get to the third point, which um uh one of these was right. So then let's go back to recommendation eight. Value for money requires that projects should be performed efficiently by all parties in accordance with the contractual duties of professional skill. And so I think Derek also talked about this value for money. So that's why I made a call for feasibility studies, the return of these, to ensure that all our major capital investments are not dictated by someone waking up one morning and saying, here's what we need a highway. I just say, what is the feasibility like? Have we considered the environmental implications, the social impact, and so on? Um, these things are these things are very important. So, value for money is something we need to definitely consider as part of um, um, recommendation eight. So, I think I covered three um, recommendations. Let me cover two more. Eleven recommendation eleven. Local contractors and consultants must be prepared to adopt a flexible approach, acquire new expertise and skills, with a view to delivering value for money by whatever procurement method the client may choose. Now, I am one that advocates just like Derek and Adish for local content. I believe that we have expert engineers, contractors, quantity surveyors, architects, financial person, project managers, we have them in the country. We have, I always say West Indies or Caribbean people are bright, we are intelligent, so we have them. I think the only time we need to bring in expertise is when we don't have that particular expertise and not bring them in all the time because one of the things that happen when you're bringing foreign consultants or foreign contractors, what do they do? They, they hire the local contractors and local consultants to do all the like work, and then they are paid. So the money, I mean, if you're looking at um, value for money and local content, we need to look at that in respect of that um, recommendation. I think I covered four. The final one is um, rules requiring, this is recommendation 14 here. Rules requiring signed or formal construct should either be enforced or amended, not ignored. This is actually boils down to some personal ethics. I saw recently, and um, again, I have to be respectful in the room, I saw there was an allegation in the, in the media that a particular contract was awarded and they ignored the, the, the requirement of having a CEC, okay? And when you look at the designated order activities of the EMA Act, that project necessitated a CEC. So this is an ethical issue. Why, if, if it is built in the contract, why are we ignoring systems that have been put in place to ensure that we get value for money? So I stop at this point again, um, thank you for the consideration and on to the other colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, some very interesting points, which uh, it, it certainly in my mind, it's sparking a lot of questions. Uh, Adesh, would you like to, uh, give five points as well. Which would you consider are the most high priority issues that should be addressed, recognizing that the this is a people industry as well? well that's, a, that's a very that's a very difficult question, but um, the five that I, I mean, I, 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 it was a difficult choice. I mean, I was kind of on the, on the fence with some of what um, Don had uh, mentioned there, um, but if I have to pick five, my own would be, um, the recommendation number five, planning authorities and utility companies should reduce their response times to a minimum. Attention should be given to coordinating the range of regulatory approvals required with a view to motivating developers to obtain all such content before starting work. Um, again, I think that's a problem we have locally in terms of getting the required approvals from the, the relevant statutory and regulatory agencies. And, um, Again, it comes back to uh, are those agencies properly staffed? Do they have the competent personnel to do these reviews and to do these approvals? These are these these are some of these questions that, that need to be answered. We also have to look at um they're talking about with a view to motivating developers to obtain all such content before starting work. Well, what are the penalties? 
Um, what I don't see locally is that you, you get you're getting these what they are penal that what the whatever penalties are are uh, are there that they're being enforced. We don't we don't see that locally. I mean, yeah, there are some state-owned projects that 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 they start construction without they they getting their the, the own all the approvals in place. I mean, they they're basically violating their own their own rules. Um, so that that's that's one of those that was one point that um that I would I would put we need to pay attention to. The second one is um again it's a kind it kind of um uh bridge is a bridge with with, with um the local content. So I uh, recommendation ten the employment of foreign contractors and consultants when appropriate should be accompanied by appropriate programs for training of local personnel, both in construction techniques and extending into design and management issues, particularly concerning design build procurement. Um, my place of employment. When I um, when I speak to the older the older head, um, and they tell me about the, the large scale project that um, was undertaken in the country in the 1970s and 1980s, they 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 told me and they, they told me that there there was some level of technology transfer between the foreign the foreign consultants the foreign contractors and the locals, but since then in the 90s and the in the, the 2000s we're not seeing that we we're seeing we we're seeing these 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 um the employment of these foreign contractors, these, these foreign consultants. And again, they, they give the local consultants as, as, Don, as Don, Don had said some, some of the, um, the dog work to do, right? And then, but then, then they basically, um, they basically get, get, the, uh, get the, the credit for, for, for basically everything. And there's no, there's no they, they, they come and they go and you don't get that, that, that skill set. The locals having the skill set that, that the, when, when the foreigners came down with um whatever skill set that they have that we couldn't that they couldn't source locally, you don't get that that transfer to the locals so that for future projects of a similar yeah. nature, we could look at the, the, the local consultants, the local contractors to undertake it. Um my next one would be recommendation 20, which is there should be an assumption wherever contractual obligations are taken on. That the parties will be held to account for any non-performance of such obligation. This should include enforcement of any additional sums payable to the contractor and the payment of damages by the contractor for any culpable delay. Any such claims on either side should be properly formulated before being settled, if possible, by amicable means. Again, it comes back to that you have some, some uh, obligation to, to ensure that that you you fulfill the terms and conditions of your contract and if you don't do that there are penalties and these penalties will be applied it applies to, it should apply to consultants it applies to contractors it should and again it also should apply to the state enterprises uh, uh, one example would be if the state enterprise if they don't um pay the, con the contractors on time what what is it what's the penalty there um you under the FIDIC Red Book, there are some there are provisions for for late payment. But from what I have seen recently in, um, in a particular state enterprise, they have deleted that clause. They expect the contractors that that if they get paid late, there's there's no penalty to the to the, to the employer. Uh, so basically, the, the employer can pay the contractor late, and then the contractor has to finance the project basically, and there's 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 no recourse that the contractor can take against the against the employer and I think that's very that's a very unfair uh, position that the that the that, that particular state enterprise has taken has taken and I expressed my my view on that to the state enterprise when I read it with particular clause. Um, so that's 20. The next one would be recommendation 37. Let me just read that one out for the benefit of everyone. Sorry about that. 37, procurement rules applying to government agencies in the field of construction should be, should in general be the same. Agencies applying different procurement rules should either justify any differences or take steps to adopt uniform rules. The Ministry of Finance should renew its efforts to achieve uniform procurement rules for all government agencies undertaking construction operations. Uh, just to give an example, um, again, you have NEDCO having different procurement rules, the UDECOT having different procurement rules, the Education Facilities Company Limited. Um, again, you have all these state enterprises um, undertaking these, these large scale projects on, on behalf of, of the government. And um, 
they, they have basically different procurement tools. And I think this is something that they could basically standardize. Uh, that's something that we need, we need to really look into. And the last one would be uh, recommendation <coughs> number 39. The reviewing of tenders and the making of decisions upon the award of contracts should be undertaken in as transparent a manner as possible, including demonstrating clear compliance with procurement rules so as to allay suspicion of improper action or potential corrupt influences. Um, just from my personal experience, I mean, we are, I was dealing with a contractor and, now, and our client had indicated that they wanted to ensure we do um, contractor performance evaluation. And, and again, I, I did evaluation and the contractor got a poor score. And I know from, a, he was on another project with another consultant. I know that other consultant gave him a poor score. And yet, a short while after this contractor was awarded a, a major infrastructure development project by the same client. I mean, I can't understand how they didn't take that, those four scores in their account in awarding this contract. And then as far as I understand, this, the, the project which was supposed to finish, well, this new project that, that the contractor was awarded, which was supposed to finish um, a while back is still ongoing. So obviously contractor's performance is still not good on that, on that new project. I mean, oh, that, 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 that's something that I think we need to, we need to address. I mean, how did that contractor get, get that, that major project and, and that project was much bigger than the, the, the project that where I and the other consultant uh, where we did evaluation of this contract on. That, that's a problem that we need to address. Um, I wish you had given me more than five, but I'll, if I had to limit it to five, <laughs> plus five I would I would, I would, I would think. Yeah, I, thank you for that. I can certainly um, appreciate why you say you would like to talk about more than five. Though. There was a lot there, and uh, I, I think to try and get a flavor of what is, uh, as professionals, as high-level professionals with the industry, I deliberately set it at five so that the audience could also have a feeling for what areas were of greatest concern for you as leading professionals in the industry. Derek, we've heard experience, value for money, contractor expertise and con uh, local content, formal contracts, sticking to the rules, planning approvals, technology and training transfer, accountability. What else would you like to add to that list? It's, it covers many, many aspects of the procurement and delivery process. What, what other issues would you like to, to see addressed as a matter of urgency? Well, well, John, um, I have taken my own personal aspects out of this. I'm looking at um, research that has been done based on scientific data by masters in construction management students at the University of West Indies who have produced distinction theses. And I have two in particular, one that was done on the contractor side, you know, in terms of what the contractors ranked as their, their top 10 problems, and um, one that was done on the employer side, in which the employers ranked what their top, top 10. Now, um, from the 91 recommendations in the, in the of inquiry, both researchers reduced the categories of those um, recommendations into one, one researcher is in 43 categories and the other one um, 54 categories using the same category classification that is internationally recognized, as I, as I mentioned before. Now, 42 of the um, 91 recommendations made by, by Professor Off are in the top 10. But I have selected the top five that the, both the employers and the contractors combined have have ranked, you know, as, as the, the, the top five. And, I, I, and, I, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you the first one, and no surprise to me, it's inadequate project definition or project scope or poor briefing. Now we all know Oxford University has done a lot of research on this over, the, over a period of, from since the 1980s. And it's still the number one problem in, in um, poor project performance. And that is, that is recommendation number three in the, in, in the 
there must be proper definition of the tasks and functions to be undertaken by project managers. Where separate roles are to be performed by different managers, there must be clear delineation between the functions of different parties so that they neither conflict nor overlap. So, so that's the first, the first uh, one that both employers and the, um, the employers ranked that as number one. Funny enough, eh, it's the employers who are ranking number one for project definition, who are the ones that are supposed to produce a proper project definition. And contractors have ranked for project definition as the number two problem they have. Their number one was adverse weather conditions. I'm not surprised. But their number two is poor project definition. So it shows that there's inadequate briefing, inadequate preparation at the planning stage, at the planning stage of a project before it hits the, the ground. And we know why that happens, John. It happens because everybody wants to go and turn the sod and say the project has started. And we all know that construction projects is not like baking bread. You just need the put everything together, give it that need, swell up enough 20 minutes, you put it in the oven, and whoops, we have bread in, 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 in 30 to 45 minutes. That's what they're trying to do in construction projects in Trinidad all this time. And that's not how construction projects are run. Construction project requires time, requires proper planning. If we don't proper plan, we waste taxpayers' funds because more money is spent during the construction with a contractor having to stand up and wait for project information. And that's where all the claims and the money is. Anyway, I'm not going where for the reasons why. But the second, the second, uh, significant uh, impact that uh, both contractors and, cli and, and clients agree on, you know. And it's one as well that the contractors have also classified as their number one problem. Payment issues, delayed payments. And we, have, we have six and there's a seven thesis being done now on unfair payments and the amount of recommendations that each of these have made in terms of security of payment, payment and statutory adjudication, I don't know why we're still talking procurement when the number one problem that contractors are having is payment. <clears throat> and you know what? The employers have classified that as their number 10 ranked problem. Imagine the, if of 91 recommendations by 42 in the top 10, the employers have that as number 10 and they won't pay. Now we know who the major employer is in trying to be good in the construction industry. Almost 90% of the work done in construction in Trinidad and Tobago is done by the state. And if the state doesn't pay its contractors on time, I can tell you it, right? Several countries, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, you know Canada, right? You know. China, United States, the United Kingdom, you know, legislation, Malaysia, Singapore, all these countries, governments have actually enacted legislation to make them pay on time. Imagine you say government enacts legislation on themselves to make, and you know why, John? The construction industry is the economic barometer of a country. And if you don't pay your contractors in time, and I know the small-minded people who feel we shouldn't pay the contractors in time because we don't have funds, we're going to start the job, you know, it's all political and we don't need to, 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 to pay everybody. We're going to pull back all the claims and not pay it. And, 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 and big procurement agencies in this country doing that, eh? For infrastructure and so forth. And I'm going to tell, and they believe that if you drip drop pay them, right that we are doing ourselves a favor i'm telling you you're not doing a favor here's why because the construction industry is the economic barometer of a country when you don't pay your contractors on time 
there's a knock-on effect right down the supply chain. All the way down, down to the manufacturers, down there. And you know what you're doing? You're creating an economic drag. You are actually creating an economic drag in your country. And so you're trying to get, you're trying to establish growth. You're trying to establish development and you're creating an economic drag. And not only that, by starving your construction industry of the monies, you are also starving them of the innovation and entrepreneurship that is required to be competitive in the global market. That's the number two problem. And legislation is required, we're wasting our time. Listen, we know what they're gonna do with, with procurement. It's time to move on to the next one, the most important one, pay people on time. You know, and, and, and if you go to number 34 recommendation, you will see that professor talks about the right to payment. You know, right? He talked about recommendations for good practice should include recommendations that in place interim payments based on measurement contracts should provide for agreed milestone payments with appropriate condition governing the right to payment. That's the number two problem. I ain't reached procurement yet. Eh? <laughs> right, one and two, definition. The third problem identified by researchers. Funny enough, this is where we, coincidence, get a knock off, get a knock here. Bills of quantities, right? Contractors have ranked bills of quantities being the number two problem. And the employers have ranked it as being the number nine problem. But Professor Off's recommendation, which is at 35, says recommended good practice should, should include recommendations that conditions of contract should place responsibility for bills of quantity where used, and I'm going to tell you, less than 20% of the projects. And we're talking about every single year, several billions of dollars of taxpayers' money is being spent without a bill of quantity on a project, right? Where bills of quantities are used, the contractor, including the acceptance of any errors of measurements or description by reference to the other contract documents so that, so that the contract operates as a lump sum, and I suspect he means a firm price lump sum here, contract subject to order variations. Now, that recommendation, he made that ring because he knows that when a contractor is pricing a document, right, even if he finds errors, he divides the quantity by the actual price and he puts it, the price and the rate. So he's already being compensated for the error. So he said here, Professor said, let them take the responsibility and stop using it as an excuse to get extra monies, you know, all right? Surplus profits. So he, this is what he say, you know, and, and I'm supporting him there too as well. But I have to say that, you know, the majority of bills of quantities prepared on infrastructure works, you know, are not prepared by quantity surveyors when you see that those that are prepared you know and it's unfortunate the fourth uh, that's what one two three the fourth that uh, significant problem identified by of you know that both contractors and employers have ranked is key performance indices recommendations for good practice for project success and that is ranked uh, 14 by contractors. I don't know why contractors don't want to see good project success. And number four by the employers. And I'm, I'm not surprised. So if we go to, to number four, which is recommendation number 28, right? The objectives of the Cabinet Oversight Committee should also include the drawing up and keeping under review recommendations for good practice 
for the construction industry are trying to make it. I haven't seen anything since 2010 in that respect. And you can't draw up recommendations for good practice in a little room by yourself. Eh? This has to be an industry-wide thing. Everybody has to have an input into it. I haven't seen it since 2010. And this is this is in the of recommendations. Eh? Right. And the fifth, the fifth one, and funny enough, the fifth one also has to deal with key performance indices, recommendation for good practice for project sets. And that is number 56. Right? Number 56 in here is I have it. Right. To the extent the solution for the construction industry embodied in the white paper are not to be implemented. Other measures and safeguards should be introduced to secure attainment of the principles of value for money, transparency, and accountability. None of these are my choices, John. This is the choice that the data gathered from employers and contractors who have been investigated through the answering of questionnaires that have gone through statistical analysis of relative importance index and severity index on the impact that they would have on construction, you know, that researchers have done. And these are the top five. Now I could go on, but like I say, these are the top five and I totally agree with them. They are very, very important. Uh, thank you, Derek. And thank you to all three of you. I myself have noticed that since the uh, since the 1980s, there has been a change in the pro uh, project, in broad terms, project procurement methods. We have moved away from a traditional design bid build model where there was a lot of thinking done ahead before anybody decided to act. Uh, and perhaps that's something which is missing now. It certainly, from my perspective, seems to have driven issues such as inadequate project definition. Uh, people aren't looking at what is actually required. The, the periods for feasibility studies have been re reduced. The periods for tendering have been reduced. The construction periods have been reduced. Uh, and I agree somewhat with Derek that there is a political motivation to turn the sod, to be seen to be doing different things. As I indicated before, this is a people industry. Politicians are people. We might not want to recognize that from time to time, but politicians are people. Contractors are people. Those who work for the state-owned enterprises are people. And we each bring to it something of our own, of our own selves as well. But if we were to look at it in the primary two areas, let's look at it from the contractors and the professional bodies within the industry. And then let's look at it also from the position of the state-owned enterprises, uh, the people who are charged by government with delivering these assets on their behalf. From the industry side, from the contractors side, from the professional bodies side, Adesh, how do you think that the industry can react? How can it self-regulate? How can it improve itself? Well, again, in terms of the from um, well, the again come back to like the off recommendation that the the roles of the the key personnel from the from the employer, from the contractor, from the consultant, they need to you need to ensure that that it, that it well, appropriate they appropriately qualified the experienced personnel. Um, so that, uh, again, it um they need again be they they need to take be proactive and. In, in the actions, the, um, if they if they if they foresee some something happening, they, they need to, to, to highlight to bring it bring it to everyone's attention. Um, and again, we, we need to be. I, I think we, I think what we the what we lack in Trinidad is collaboration. It's the employers against the consultant and the contractor. The contractors against the consultant and the employer. The, the, the consultants against the contractor, and we don't have that collaborative effort among among the, among the three parties. And then that 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 is something that we, we have a, we have an issue with. Um, the other thing is that again, in terms of the 
the, the, the management, we need to make sure that, that um, from all sides, from the employer, the, the consultant, and the, and, the, and, the, and the contractor, the appropriate project management techniques are being, have been implemented and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, being followed. And um, again, if, you, if you're picking up, if you're picking up, if the contractor sees see some sort of error that uh, they highlighted, it, it, it's brought to everyone's attention so that it, so it can be dealt with. And I think um, when I did my master's in England, I, was, I had some exposure to the new engineering contract. And one of the comparisons that they made with the, with the, with the FIDIC form, the FIDIC, let's use the FIDIC Red Book, is that in the new engineering contract, there was a clause for, early warning. So if the contractor, if the, if a reasonably experienced contractor foresaw an issue in the design that he had an obligation to bring it to the attention of, of, of the engineer and not sit down like on the FedEx Red Book and say, okay, that's the way I can go and claim for I can I can I can submit a claim and, and make X amount of dollars more on this on this contract. Um, uh, again, we, we need, I think, in terms of these self-regulation is not, I don't think the individual bodies, the contractors, the association, Trans Tobago, the association of professional engineers, or the, or the professional, the various professional bodies, and then the various state enterprises. I think they need to, they need to be a collaborative effort among all of them, and that we have the same objectives and the same goals, and, and, and we are implementing the appropriate, the appropriate practices to, to, to achieve that. Um, Again, everybody has to has to has to ensure that 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 they perform their their their, their, their duties and their duties as 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 um defined in their in their terms of contract with with their with the relevant employer, the consultant and the state enterprise or and or the contractor, the state enterprise. Everybody's everybody's um performing their their, their contractual duties and in terms of time in terms of timely delivery of of services, timely delivery of designs. Um, Proper, we we ensuring that, and again, and again, I think you had, you had raised that you had raised a a point there where in, in terms of um reduction in tender the time for, for for tender submission, we the 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 the, the drive to turn the sword. We're not giving the contractors enough time to, to to properly analyze the contract, to properly price the stuff, and then you have um these short tender periods. The contractor puts in his price, and he realizes only after well he didn't get he didn't factor in for X, Y, and Z or whatever it is because we short tender period, and then he starts to take a defensive position and and when he's doing when he's doing submitting claims and being very defensive and and, and probably aggressive towards the consultant and towards the employer. Um, we we need we need to we need to we need to we need to do to to, to, to deal with, with those kind of things. We need to give the, the, the again come back with the designs also. The, um, you need to give the consultant an, an appropriate time for, for undertaking the, feas the appropriate feasibility studies. If, it's a, if they have a pre-feasibility study, feasibility studies, detailed uh, conceptual design, detailed design, preparation of tender documents, we need to ensure you have, you have the appropriate time for that. It comes back to, um, in terms of, in terms of it comes back to your, your long-term planning. Uh, in terms of, we don't have this with elections every five years, we just have a five-year horizon planning period in, in in the country. We need we need to put the greater good of the country at at hand and, and do a, a long term, a twenty-year projection in terms of planning. And we we, we stick to the plan. We uh, we work the plan. We stick to the plan. Um, what we also need to what we also need to look at would be in terms of um again with the self-regulation that we have, we ensure that um contracts. Uh, uh, yeah, proper contract in place, and um, in terms of uh, and well that, and the proper terms and conditions of contract are fair to all parties. Um, I have had um, personal sighting of of where a state enterprise awarded a contract, the contract, and the bill of quantities came afterwards. After the contract was awarded, and then they developed a bill of quantities to match the, the accepted contract amount. I, I personally saw that that particular instance there, right? I mean that that was something very worrisome with in terms of what what's what's going on. Um, uh, another one is so many things to talk about. Um, again, we need to ensure that um, to protect the employer, to, pr to protect the employer. That the appropriate securities, performance securities, advanced payment securities are in place. So if we have a default on the on the part of the contractor, on the part of the consultant, 
that that the, the state that the taxpayers' money is, is protected that there is some some recourse that if you don't have performance by the consultant or the contractor, there is recourse that can be taken that can that can perform that can protect that can protect the, the taxpayers' money. Um, I think that's uh, I kind of summarize what my views are on that. Um, I've handed back over to the other the other panelists for their own for their own opinions. You on mute, John. Thank you. I knew one of us was going to make the mistake, and it was obviously going to be me, wasn't it? Um, Don, over to you. I did notice uh, from Adesh's comments a few very telling issues there, which both sides of the industry should address. Collaboration. Is the industry too hierarchical? Should it be a flatter structure? Should we actually move towards something like the new engineering form of contract or the alliancing or IPD model, which is in favor at the moment in North America? Good faith. Should there be, should there be a need, should the industry look to bring good faith into contractual practices? Should the professional organizations sit down and agree common goals and one of them in particular, this limited planning horizon, which at only five years could be based around what a, a what an incoming government thinks its life expectancy would be. Uh, I know we have five year election terms in Trinidad, but should the country have a 30 year plan or a 20 year plan? Uh, I know in Pratik Manning's era as prime minister, he did look forward. He did have a vision 2020. So, Don, over to you. What are your thoughts on those? How can the industry improve? Well, uh, we have many things to consider here, but the first thing I want to consider is uh, our friend's comment in the uh, chat. I just wanted to read it all. Because as comical, it's not a comical comment. It has a comical nature, but it's a very serious comment. And he said, yeah, we used to call it Rashfi back in primary school days, backfitting the BOQ to suit. Now, that comment probably is very descriptive for many of our colleagues. Oh, no, sorry, let me rephrase that. For some of our colleagues in the industry. When you look, when you when persons hearing us know will think, hey, this construction industry is a mess. No, it's not that at all. The, I would say that most of our colleagues will complain. So I'm going to take an out of the box approach to this issue right now. Of course, I agree with everything Adesha and Derek say because I've said it many times as well along with them. So they are quite correct in how they paint the, the industry at its present. The out of the box approach is one. Let's talk about the, the associations or the civil society um, association that's supposed to be advocating. We have the JCC and um, Afro himself used to be a few of the JCC at one point. And we have the current JCC president who is trying. He's making statements um, every so often. And I don't see an acknowledgement by any leader in industry of the statements which he is making. Whatever what he is doing, whether it's procurement, roads, drainage, whatever. That's one. Now, the JCC is an umbrella organization. It does represent some um, other organizations, APITA and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, if we are ignoring the civil society organizations, then we have a real problem in the industry. So that's one. The second thing is, consider that there are only two organizations in the entire country that have done a lot of seminars and have done advocacy for this. And one of them being the one that we know, Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute, and the other one being, which Derek and I am very active in, Derek particularly was one of the founders of it, was the Construction Management Institute of Trinidad and Tobago. Because the Construction Management Institute of Trinidad and Tobago recognized that other organizations just were not standing up. But when you look at, a, a, and I'm not knocking CCGI here, so I'm going to be very careful. When you look at our seminar today, there should have been 500 participants in the seminar, at least. I have been looking at trends in seminars we've posted, even with the Construction Management Institute, over the last several years. We complain, and when it's time to advocate, we don't advocate. And when some of us are advocating, we stand like the cheese stand alone. 
And we are, we are thought about as complainers. But what we advocating for is the right thing. What Derek and Adish is advocating along with himself for is the right thing to the industry. So let's talk about the, so that is, I'm going to just park that issue on the issue of um, representation industry. In fact, yes, the industry could come together and they have, but for, for, for some reason, which is only known to me, why is the industry fragmented at this point in time? The Contractors Association, I, I, I must say I have not heard any utterances from them for the last year possibly with respect to these issues and they represent contractors. I'm not knocking the head of the association. I know him very well, that's Glenn. He is an advocate, but for some reason they're silent. The point is, have we lost our independence in the country to advocate for these issues? So that's one. The second thing I want to bring up here is the issue of whether the entire industry is a mess. No, it's not. What, what we all bring up today are issues that are very much plaguing our industry. However, you talk to most people, most people want to do the right thing. Most people are doing the right thing. But for people to stand up against those in power who are doing, and I'm not saying, but I mean those in power, to be either politically or not, okay? But to stand up to those persons in power who are not doing the right thing is very challenging because you could lose your job. Young people in our construction industry are quite frustrated with this. Now let's talk about some of the things that Derek talked on. And one of the things they talked about was um, if you have an engineer doing a design, and the engineer, and I've spoken to a young engineer who told, and she, she, she's quite frustrated. She said she did the design to the best of her knowledge, and she was told by a non technical person, hey, we don't want that. We want something else. We want something less costly. So the problem with that is we have to give the adequate time for design. Adequate time for procurement, as both Arish and Derek were saying. But we're not doing it because of our five year political cycle. And until we don't get to a point where we look, we need to come back on and say, what projects are necessary for the country? Do we need another highway or do we need to fix the existing road network? And I've advocated fix the road network first, then you could build a highways if by need they're necessary. We need to come back on and see what projects impact people the most. Derek said, and this is true, that it's the economic parameter of the country. We were also taught in, um, um, in engineering and by Mr. Nils, who um, additionally was very well at Trinidad Plan and so on. I, I, Mr. Nils was my boss as well. And he always said, the economic life of a country is measured by its transportation network, or the efficiency of it. So if we are not putting the resources and, and the funds in those areas, then the entire thing is not going to work. So, so that's just going a little bit out of the box, right? But it comes back to another is, you know, contract development. So we have something called conditions of contract. I remember many years ago, I would do a condition of contract. It might be about 40, 50 pages. And it tailored to our particular construction climate in this region. I have had complaints from persons who saying that they've been asked to take out clauses of the condition of contract. And if you're going to start wrong, then ultimately you're going to end wrong. Why are we sabotaging our own contracts in place? Everything that Adish, Derek, and myself talked about, performance, one, securities, whatever you have, those are well-established systems that if enforced, could do a whole lot. But I boil back down to personal ethics. Are we losing our, are some of us, not all of us, are some of us losing our personal ethics and unable to let it stand and let it oppose those persons who don't want to see transparency in our country? And I, I come back to the example that at, at this point in time, we do not have a regulator. And at this point in time, we have not proclaimed the procurement legislation. And at this point in time, we have taken out a clause out of the procurement legislation, which allows some entities to have no oversight. And that is what the industry needs to stand for. What is right? Thank you. Thank you, Don. There's some very interesting points there. And Derek, I'd, I'd like to pass across to you now. Um, 
it comes across from Don's comments, from my understanding of it, that there's a potential loss of independence with the indus within the industry, and a fear of being of standing up to be counted. Now, I have a separate question which I'll come back to later on that, but in relation to the way that, uh, in relation to Don's comments, this unfair sharing of risk by amending the contract. Do you think that the presence of a regulator is going to help that? And how would you recommend a regulator works within the industry to, uh, to lobby the government to, to, to bring this improvement, which you're all saying is needed? You know, um, John, what uh, Don said is not untrue. If we start from the 1960s, government involvement in construction, you know, colonial days from then, it was only about 30%. Private sector did about 70% of the work. As soon as we moved from the 60s, 70s was more or less the same. We got up to the 80s when we had the, the first first set up, the first boom. And government involvement moved in that boom from that 30% to 40 to 60%. And the reason for that was the introduction of what we call G2G, government to government arrangement, contractual arrangements. And it hasn't gone back down. We moved from the, the, the 1980s and by 2000, government was doing 75% of the work in the construction sector. That was the introduction of design bill and design bill forms of procurement. And then from the 2000s to now, government is doing about 89, 90% of the amount of money spent in the construction industry, you know, and and that is significant through these, um, these PPPs, you know, it's a form of design bill with finance and all kind of stuff in it now, you know, right? We, we, have, we have moved from 30% to government taking a massive control of the construction industry. And they're doing this through just about four large, and I call it monopoly, you know, special purpose company. And you know how good Monopoly is for any industry. It's fantastic. It allows them to take advantage of everybody. That no engineer, architect, quantity surveyor, contractor, subcontractor, supplier, manufacturer, they speak ill about them for fear they will get no work. This is an unhealthy position for our construction industry. It also stifles, again, innovation and entrepreneurship. How are you going to develop innovation and entrepreneurship if you take taking control, you know, 89, 90% of an industry? an industry that is the most important industry outside of the energy sector, non-energy. You know, it's the industry where every job on site has a multiplier effect of creating four to six more jobs downstream. So because of that control, you've basically controlled the employment sector because it's the largest employer outside. So there's nobody and no organization there at this moment speak ill, you know, of their methods of operation. I'm ready to say, yeah, it, 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 it's what it is, you know. Now, there was a recent case, 2017, there was a judge who was bold enough to say something in that case, Justice James Abood. And this goes back to what Don was alluding to. 
he talked about something called unlawful means conspiracy. He said that it was a new thought in England and the Commonwealth, and it has been developing incrementally since 2008. He said it has been unanimously endorsed by the House of Lords or the Supreme Court of, Eng of England. And he says, he gave us seven examples of where the thought of conspiracy can be found. Number one, he said special purpose company engages in the awarding and management of construction contract that is not part of, of its mandate. We have seen that. He says the respective engineers appointed by the employer under each of its construction contracts is in breach of his employment duties and or his duties as engineer under the respective contracts. Certified payments for work without verifying whether those works have been carried out. He says it's simply rubber stamping valuations. We, listen, I know of many professionals who just sit down in their office and do valuations, you know. They don't even go out on the site. They don't even do inspections anymore. They don't do any testing anymore. They let the contractor test himself. I have had to do a project audit on some construction projects. And there was a contractor who submitted 1,028 tests, all 100% pass. That defies statistical logic. You cannot have 100% in tests. Not calibrating the equipment before doing all the tests and submitting it and the engineer accepting it. Which engineer accepts 100% of 1,028 tests? All passed good 100%. You know, even in the best uh, statistical thing, which we talk about uh, standards inside of a factory where you have a controlled environment, you know, you, know, you can get what? 92% to 96%, you know, in terms of accuracy. So I, this, is, this is the sort of things that we need to understand that we have, we as professionals have an obligation, but the question is no professional wants to stand up and then be ostracized. I have had several of our students from the university who have gone out there and, and, and look and we taught them ethics and morality. We teach them ethics and morality, it's a subject. No, because it's because our qualifying body, right? You know, which is the, the, the body that gives you accreditation for your course, requires it to be taught. And, 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 and by common sense, it should be. But they go out there and they meet people who tell them, their seniors who say, no, nah, don't worry with that. You know, we've been doing this like this all the time. You can't come here and change this thing, you know. And then pressuring them to sign, to sign, because the senior don't want to sign, you know, he wants to pressure the junior to sign. You know, and so we have to understand that this monopolistic behavior at the state in an industry as important like this, you know, it just cannot continue. We have to reverse some trends. And who will not speak out, it, you know, bodies will not speak out, you know, in respect of these things, or else you get victimized. James Some very Abu, important. Yeah, Sorry, James Abu also said that practical completion and or completion of contracts and or interim payment certificates issued to contractors purporting to verify the works are undertaken and are satisfactorily completed. You know, where quantities constructed were less than those stated in the bills of quantities or works have been omitted 
and were defective and or useless and or not needed and paid for. He says, these are examples. This is examples. And I, there, are, there, are, there are others, you know, but in his <clears throat> final statement, he said, unlawful can include the thought of bribery, the thought of unknowing receipt, and dishonest assistance. In a nutshell, he's guiding us. And this is a construction case, you know, and he's guiding us to say, I know what is happening out there. So I have found it pertinent to bring to bear a new thought that is outside of the country that is recognized by our highest court. You know, and therefore he say that we need to look at this if we have to address or rectify or reverse the trends of what is happening in our industry. And, and it's critical. So we had off 2010. We have judgments that have taken place in our courts. We have not yet made a dent in, in ensuring that the 91 recommendations, 42 of which are in the 10 top ranked most significantly to impact the performance of our industry, have not been adequately addressed 13 years later. And that's that's where, where I'd, I'd like to leave it. There's some, there's some very probing points there. Uh, the reliance on the public purse. That's also, uh, I, as in somebody with a limited knowledge of the history of Trinidad and Tobago, gained over the uh, 10, 12 years I was living there, that seems to have been uh, also concurrent with the growth and then demise of the oil industry and the demise of the sugar industry. Is it a case that construction has taken the part, uh, taken a significant part of the economy which those two industries previously occupied? Um, the potential monopoly being unhealthy through for, uh, through four principal state-owned enterprises, but also you you've mentioned things which I see and uh, there's uh, Adesh had actually posted in the comments about the issue of quality assurance, that it's been removed from the consultant's scope of work and been reliant upon contractors. Now, I see things like that every day in other jurisdictions as well. Um, and I see many, of, many similar problems to the ones which we've discussed so far today in other jurisdictions. Um, and the performance of state-owned enterprises, the performance of contracting organizations. Given that this is this is possibly a function of the world moving forwards and people bringing into Trinidad the philosophies from other jurisdictions to put more responsibility on the contractor, for example, uh, to regulate itself to to be a, a single point of delivery. Uh, and to reduce the reliance on government entities. Many of these models have worked elsewhere. The state-owned enterprise has worked extremely well in Europe for delivery of, uh, delivery of public assets. So, uh, Don, why would you think that it's not being quite so successful in Trinidad? All right. Um... So let me see if I ask you, let me clarify this question. The question is why isn't the model of self-regulation by contractors successful? Is that the question? Why isn't, the, isn't that model successful? Why, is the, why isn't the model of procurement through state-owned enterprises quite as successful as it is in other countries as well? Where, okay. where do you perceive the failings to be? So I wouldn't say necessarily that um, we have failed totally. I think there are success stories. I mean, I want to be fair because I am mindful of the participants in the room, um, some from Unicot and 
in the Chief Agriculture and so on. Um, there are success stories where the model works. But often in Trinidad media, we would hear about those that didn't work. So to me, we you wouldn't, it is not, it's not it's obviously not entity, you know, I to report on models that worked. Um, I think um, with Adish um, experience at Trinidad and Derek's experience at QESL and so on, and all the other um, uh, persons we have in the room, there are models that work. I think the challenge here is looking at those projects which are scrutinized. So let us look at what, what has been reported in the media and why we think it doesn't work. Those projects which are mostly scrutinized are those which are the, what you call, for the better word, a mega project, okay? The highways, roads, things that affect people majorly on a daily basis. There may be other situations or other projects where um, they are mega in nature, but for some reason the focus is not there. <coughs> why the model uh, has not worked totally is because we haven't customized that one entirely, and we haven't also enforced our customization. So let me explain. It comes back to a point I was making before about the conditions of contract. There are times you open a contract, in my experience, past experience, and the conditions of contract really apply to Canada, to United States, to England. Because we just copy it. We didn't use conditions of contract applicable to Trinidad. But then, have we done enough research? But Derek is talking about the research done with his students. Have we taken that research and driven it into the industry? There seems to be a little bit of disconnect right now between research and industry. Because researchers are doing good work at both universities. They're doing excellent work. But has the research been accepted by the industry or is it packed up in a library? And that is what we need to get to. So, we, so that is one area, in my opinion, consider the opinion why the model may not have worked. I have said this over and over again, the issue of ethics. Now let's talk about the roads. That's something I advocate for all the time. You'll see more the media talking about roads, spell mill everywhere. Why it is we gave a contract to a road, let's say about a few weeks ago, and thereafter the road has no... Um, Oh, let's use the Trinidad plans, break up. Okay? There are many things wrong there. And, and I'm talking about the famous road, the one in Manzanilla, right? So I'm not going to call any names, obviously, but we know the road. And, and now, it's now, I mean, Adesh and I was talking about this, and Adesh is a very excellent geotechnical engineer, so I give all credit to him on this one. And we talked about gradation and so on. But then, if gradation is the issue, couldn't that we have, could we have solved that? Yes. There are systems in place to do all of these tests. Derek was talking about tests as well. There are systems in place to ensure quality assurance. There are systems in place to ensure effective contract management. There, there is a lot of data, research all over the internet. It's hundreds of years of data and how we do construction projects. So the question as to why the model isn't working is because some of us, and I say this very openly, we are sabotaging our own model. We are simply, some of us are simply ignoring the tenants of the contract, right? I am, I said this in the previous comment, but I'll just repeat it here is that we have young people who are quite frustrated, right? They, they are frustrated because they go into the universities, they learn how to do it the right way. And when they come out, they're being told, hey, don't do it this way, do it the wrong way. How are we going to overcome this generational issue? So, I think the model is there, the information is there, the data is there, the methods are there. We have a lot of specifications, codes, standards, what have you. But I've always said that any policy you develop, people are intelligent to develop a policy, and there are some people intelligent to find a loophole in the said policy. And this is where we are not only here in Trinidad, but it's a symptom of the world as well. So we, to overcome this, this is this is what I suggest as a solution because I only talk in problems, right? You know, my boss always say you only talk in problems, but you're not talking solutions. So let's talk solutions. One, the industry has to come together. We are not. There are persons in the, I'll tell I'll, I'm gonna share something openly here in this group. When I first started advocating, I was told by someone in the industry that you are a clown, not you, John. I don't I'm a clown. <laughs> that was the statement that was told to me. Don't you have a Why are you doing this? And I said, um, okay, if you think I'm a clone, fine. I'll put some, some makeup, whatever. 
But this is the kind of thing. And this is from a leader. I'm not going to call his name. But this is from a leader in the industry, in, in, in one of the associations. And I, and, and I said to myself, my gosh, why have we arrived? We need to come together, advocate. Now, some people say, but Don, you're only doing this because you're anti, and I'm going to say it openly, you're anti PNM. No, sir. I am neither PNM nor UNC. I'm neither red nor yellow, as they say in triangle answer. I am pro national. Okay? So, where is this government, the last government, the next government for? We need to hold the government accountable for the taxpayers' money. That is what we need to do. We need to ask them for transparency, for accountability, for everything. So when money is spent, we know we get value for money. And with respect to roads, as an example, we can't be having a we can't be fixing a road today and six months thereafter it's breaking up. And we all know the ways to fix it. We know about tests, about quality tests, so we know. The industry very much knows what it has to do. The question is, why are the leaders in the industry saying to, saying to the government of the day, here's what, we can't be operating like this. And maybe some are, but I get it's falling on, on their face. Just to highlight a comment in the um, chat there from Apple, uh, which is, which, and to quote him now, which is when himself told himself, it's even one and an old guy, so by spoiler, I want to feel it. That's true, all right, quite right, true. So. I could go on and on, but you know, I'll leave it on that point for now. Uh, thank you. I'm conscious of the time and that we're going to open up the, uh, up the floor to questions in about 15 or 20 minutes. So I, I'd like to give you each two minutes to tell me one thing which you are going to be advocate for and push through in the next two years. Of all the things we've discussed today, I want you to pick one. Adesh, where would you go with this? Ah, um, I would... That's a very difficult question. <laughs> Too much. All right. Um, I think what, what we need to ensure is that we, we need to ensure that there's accountability on the employer and the employer fulfilling their duties, the contractors fulfilling their duties and the consultants fulfilling their duties, as well as the enforcement of, I, I don't like to use the term penalties, but penalties that if they don't fulfill their duties, then we have some level of accountability for our action. And then probably people will take the their roles and their responsibilities a bit more seriously and um in terms of our in terms of the delivery of, of projects to, to the um to the citizens of the country um uh that's basically that's basically what, what i would i'll be pushing for the, the account accountability from all from all parties that's yeah, what that i would like to see that's fine. Thank you. Derek, I think Adesh may have stolen your uh, your principal talking point there. So what else would you like to see? You have you have one topic that you're going to be able to push forward on in the next two years. No, Johnny, he, he, he is quite correct. Um, you know, of the 91 recommendations made by uh, Professor Off, 28% of them talks about and addresses the issue of accountability. Accountability, you know, as an action item, when you classify it, you know, coming out in terms of the recommendation, it's the number one, um, you know, thing that I would like to see done. We talk, we talk about transparency, but transparency without accountability is just not good enough. We talk about enforcement of the contract conditions. We talk about the enforcement of, um, of making good defects. You know, we talk about the enforcement of, um, of delayed damages. You know, we talk about the enforcement in terms of flagging, you know, poor performing contractors and consultants. You know, we talk about the enforcement of the bills of quantities, you know, as a cost management tool, you know, as something that the contractor should take responsibility for and not hide behind. You know, we, we, we talk about enforcement in terms of testing that, that has now been transferred to the contract. How can you test yourself? 
and the engineering profession has given up that responsibility to the contractors. That was something that when I came into the industry, engineers used to do. You know, they used to determine the test and send it to an independent testing agency, and they used to tell the contractor that he had to either break it out, you know, or fix it. Can you imagine the contractor testing himself on a structure that doesn't meet the structural requirements of the codes? What would happen in an earthquake? Or one of these perils that we have. We have to be, you know, we have to understand. And people feel it's only doctors and so forth that deal with life. Engineers hold the lives of all of us in their hands. So in every single structure that we are in at home, in the office, driving on the road, bridges, drains, you know, airports, our lives are at stake. They should be given more responsibility. They should be, they should be nurtured and should be given the same protection as doctors in terms of, you know, but because our lives are in their hands. So accountability, and I have to agree with Arish, he's a professional engineer, he's, you know, and it's not stealing the thunder. It's because that is what is required now. Thank you. Don, you're a big yeah. advocate of procurement, so uh, procurement legislation. So I'm not going to let you use that one as your uh, as your target for the next two years. So oh, I um, wasn't going to use it. <laughs> oh, excellent. I hope you're not going to use accountability either. No, no, of course uh, not. I, no, no, I, no, no, no. I, I, I have uh, this. What I'm suggesting is is I am actually stealing it from someone. So let, let me explain what I mean. I'm stealing it out of the UK. You know, one of my good colleagues, I speak to him from time to time, is Sir John Amit of the, he's the chair of the National Infrastructure Commission in the, uh, in the UK. Yeah. And um, they did a report on flooding. So it's such an excellent report, uh, how they analyze flooding in the UK. I mean, and it, it's, it's free, yeah? you can go to the National Infrastructure Commission website and, and get that report. And of course, we know what flooding has done in our country. So therefore, the idea I'm stealing here is that we probably need, this is my call, we need to advocate for independent National Infrastructure Commission in our country. And I say independent because the Office of the Procurement Regulator is supposed to be independent, that takes our projects, ranks them through some set criteria, and says, these are the projects we are going to take on for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 year periods. And the criteria has to be based on criteria, not just about political expediency, because many of these problems that both Alish and Derek talking about is driven by <clears throat> votes. And therefore you have compromises in quality, ethics, and the like. So we need to have a National Infrastructure Commission that says, these are the projects we're gonna do, and what are the criteria that we're gonna to use to evaluate them on? Is it to the public good? Is it going to enhance economic um, development? Is it going to enhance our PR image of the country? Because that right now is definitely, I think, a challenge for us. Is it going to enhance our development as a nation? We have schools, we haven't touched on that today. We have schools that are failing, have failing infrastructure. How do we expect to educate our children in schools with some failing infrastructure? So we need to have a National Infrastructure Commission that ranks the projects, publicly funded projects. And of course the government should be listening to the National Infrastructure Commission. They prepare reports and not just park reports, listen to what they say, it's comprised of industry professionals. It could be very much sourced from the JCC, from APET, from the Institute of Surveyors, from the Construction Management Institute of Diego, but it must be a wholly collaborative effort by professionals across a wide scope, including finance persons, including developers, including uh, economists, that sits down and says, these are the projects that we must undertake and there must be a return on investment and return on investment or not always mean you know profit a return on investment could be public interest but we need to put a cost to that how do we enhance the economy for our nation over the next 5 10 15 10 years so that's my call national infrastructure commission thank you an issue which we spoke about before was difficulties of payment and uh, a lot of those issues of payment from my experience in Trinidad, arose out of um, 
diverse interpretations of the requirements of the contract, which again goes, I think, to uh, inadequate project definition and even potentially the lack of a structured payment mechanism as well. Now, the contracts which are adopted in Trinidad all have provisions for dispute resolution without going to court and without going to arbitration. But quite often they're set aside as well. Is it that those alternative methods, for example, under FIDIC, you have the dispute adjudication board, but there are others. You can have early neutral evaluation. You can have early expert opinion. Uh, you could have mediation. Is it that those are not trusted by the industry, be either side of the industry, be it the, uh, the owner side, the employer side, or the contractor side? Or is it that they rely upon arbitration and litigation, which are very, very expensive processes and usually extremely protracted? Is it that the industry as a whole is relying upon those for impartiality? And I'd love to hear the views of the three of you on what is the best way forward for the industry to get out of this, this trap of disputes, uh, this trap of litigation and arbitration, and only resolving things five or 10 years after the event. Derek, over to you again, please. John, when I came into quantity survey 40 something years ago, the quantity surveyors would mediate basically 99% of the, the problems between the contractor and the employer. And that was done pretty efficiently until commissions of inquiries and several lawyers have taken over the construction industry in terms of drafting and everything. And, and, and we, don't use, we don't use that mechanisms to resolve disputes anymore, the professionals. Now it, it's, it's, let's go to court, you know, let's go to arbitration. Let's, and I can tell you the basis of our arbitration act, it's an old archaic 1938 act that needs revamping because right now, as an attorney at law, if a client comes to me and he has a dispute, you know, and he says that he wants to use any of these dispute resolution mechanisms, I would tell him no. And I'm telling him no to save him money and time. I'd say, let's go straight to litigation because the courts have even held in Trinidad Tobago, even where there's an arbitration clause, or mediation clause, right? That the parties have agreed to be bounded by this mechanism to resolve this. The courts have let them out of that and said, no, 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 you can't oust the courts. You cannot oust the courts. We have full control. <clears throat> Final arbiter. And so you spend a lot of years going through arbitration. And you, now the process is as expensive as court, full of people like me, you know, right? You have all the professionals, wearing all the different professionals, all the different experts and all, the, you know, and then you get a, an award, as we've seen recently, right? On this, on the Solomon Uchoy Highway, and the court say, no, we don't recognize the arbitrator's award. Right, let's go back and do it over. No, you see, unless we have modern arbitration laws that narrows down the position, as in the UK, that you could you only have two grounds now, you know, for for arbitration. The arbitrator exceeded his jurisdiction, or he was patently biased, not apparent, he has to be patently biased. Right? Those are the only two in which you could challenge the arbitrator's award. Our arbitration act is like a strainer. You could challenge it at any time. And you don't even have to wait till the project finish. You could stop the project in the middle and go to arbitration and you know, and all of that. We archaic. We cannot have proper dispute resolution mechanisms 
you know, until we have a buy from the courts that they will, and if certain legislation is not there, you know, the judges really have a right to do what they have to do. And they're basically saying to you, the state, listen, you guys go and fix things, you know, because if you don't fix it, this is what's gonna happen. So, so, so my view, very cynical view in terms of dispute resolution in the, in, the, in, in the construction industry. But when we used to do it in the early days, you know, as the professional engineers and the professional architects and the professional points, we would resolve 99% of those, but now everybody walks with, you know, a litigation hat. So, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you that uh, the only people making, uh, the, or the people who seemingly make the most money out of uh, construction projects are the, cons the external consultants, the dispute resolvers, the arbitrators, the lawyers. Uh, and the expert and witness. The, I'm sorry, say again. And the expert witness. And the expert witness. Thank you for that. I'll take that as a, a dig. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the um, I, and in fact, I'd like to hear. I'd like to see some comments from the audience as to are they involved in dispute resolution and how would they like to see disputes resolved? Uh, are they happy with the process the way it is in the in the contractual framework, or do, do they find it's frustrating? It, not only frustrating them as individuals but frustrating the organizations they work for and frustrating the industry as well. Adesh, same question to you. What would you like to see happening to speed up dispute resolution? You mentioned the NEC before and that, that puts a lot of burden on good faith. Well, again, good faith is a term that we, we, we have used in, in, in Trinidad but I don't think we keep it. I mean, as I said, my personal experience is that as a consultant, that mm -hmm. one of our contracts with the employer indicated that the, the, the contract will be executed in good faith. Right? That is exactly the contract will be executed in good faith. And okay, so you pay me late. What provisions are there for, for, for me? What recompense? What recompense is there for me when you pay me late? Could could you I, we, we put this to the employer? Would, would you could you the same in the same vein under the the Fedic Red Book, you, you, the contractor is allowed to uh, claim for interest char interest charges for late payment? Would the employer extend that same good faith to the consultant and the, and the employer say, "Well, sorry, hard luck there. Uh, you, you get paid late, you get paid late. You can't claim for any interest charges." So, I mean, good faith. I mean, I think we need to we need to be very serious about the the words that we put into our contracts here and 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 and, and show we understand what the words mean and we keep it. But um, I, I just need to share my, I agree with, with um, Mr. Aldridge about the Arbitration Act. I mean, this thing was, was formulated in 1939. And the last amendment to it, I think from what, I, what I'm seeing is that it's around 1997 was the last amendment to that act. So you're looking at probably about what, 26 years past since, since that act was last amended and the, the amount of changes that have, have taken place in, in, in dispute resolution and, and what and what could be incorporated into in this act. Um, you had mentioned certain um, in your in your in your preface to the question about about mediation and um, ex early expert uh, testimony. I think I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But I, I think that those are things that we're not really probably generally we're not familiar with internet. So things like um, I think the the enlightened State well, the, the, the owners of the project as well as the consultants, contractors, what what other measures are available for dispute resolution, which which would be less uh, which would be um again less costly to everyone, um, quicker resolution, quicker resolution. We need to probably have some sort of workshops to to to, to, to give the to, to this to disseminate this information on on these alternative measures to to to, to the um the people involved in, in, in these projects so that it, we can incorporate that into into the um into, into our conditions or contract in terms of dispute resolution. And again as Mr. Outridge pointed out um the the, the court the, the, the court seems to, to, to even though the, the conditions of contract may say X, Y, and Z, 
the court says, no, 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 we'll throw that out. We are the final arbiter, right? I mean, again, we need to ensure that there's some sort of um, uh, harmonious relationship between what the conditions of contract says, what the arbitration act says, what in terms of what the, and then again, the, the court, the court of Trent and Tobago in terms of how far their, their, power, their, 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 their powers will extend in, in these sorts of circumstances. Um, that's something that 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 we need we need to we need to we need to deal with. Um, I think that's roughly about what I what I I mean my views on my views on it. But I think what we real as said what we really need to do locally is have this, some sort of workshop put on by the various professional bodies in terms of what dispute resolution alternative dispute resolution uh, measures there are. Obviously, they'll have pros and cons. And then again, is that is that collaboration in terms of um, how do we incorporate that those, those that that aspect into our conditions of contract? If there's some, if something comes up, there's there's there's, there's, a, there's a measure that can be quickly and and, and inexpensive to, in or in, in order to, to resolve these matters. I mean, right now I'm still dealing with a claim from a contractor probably about four or five years now. We're trying to sort this thing out. I mean, the employer has been slow to respond to our, and has been. So to respond to our recommendation, contractors frustrated. We are frustrated, and and then we get we, then we get call from employer. Well, you need to close this up tomorrow. So I mean, and and so we we're trying to see how best we can negotiate this thing. I mean, I've had speak with the contractor. We sit down and we, we try to see each other's point of view to, to, to try and get this thing done as painlessly as, as possible. So the alternative dispute resolution measures that are practiced in other in other territories, where, again. We need exposure. We need we need some information on that, and and could it be applied locally to our to our, to our situation? Thank you. We are now in the period where we have a Q and A. So if anybody does want to ask questions, please raise your hand. Uh, Dion Codrington uh, has actually raised a question in the chat room and said he's unable to speak at the moment. So I will read the question. Based on the experience of the panel, is the type of contracts agreed upon for projects a direct result of delayed projects as depending on the type of contract boxed vendors stroke contractors in? And the second part of the question, is there any experience where a dispute resolution would have aid, would have aid a contract change uh, not likely, but just asking. For example, a project may have started with a cost plus contract, but perhaps in time and material contract may have been better. Don, do you want to uh, address that? The first part is the type of contract boxing in uh, vendors and contractors. Well, yes. Um, well, I'll talk to Dr. 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 And then get into this question. You know, this whole issue of dispute, um, of course, I agree with what they say. Derek and Radish is talking about once the dispute has occurred and how we treated it. My philosophy on dispute is why do we have them in the first place? So why can't we avoid them in the first place? For example, a typical dispute I remember having in the early stage of development was weather. So a contractor would make a claim for weather and claim the entire rainy season. And I said to the contractor, did you not know that rain was going to fall in the rainy season? Okay. And as comical as it is, how could we have solved that? Depending on the project, we should not have started that project in the rainy season. We could use the rainy season to plan projects and use the dry season to execute. So that's just a, a park on, on the side. So I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna answer the question um, from the other a little bit, but let me just get to the other things I wanted to say. So we need to also have data and research on what is the prevalent cause of dispute. I think Derek does have some research. And once we know the source of dispute, the biggest source of dispute we would believe in contracts is not being able to understand the contract. And this comes back right back to um, office recommendation number two. And I'm just gonna repeat for sake of argument. Management should be performed by experienced persons who should take, I just have living here, positive and proactive decisions. So if you don't have the right people on the client side and the contractor side and the consultant side managing the project, you would find often that 
there is a misunderstanding or misalignment of the contract and how it is interpreted. So interpretation, so the language of the contract has to be clear, but interpretation is another issue that we have in terms of what causes disputes. Cash flow causes disputes, right? We have a, the subcontractor submits a cash flow. We accept the cash flow as a client. And when it's time to pay, and this is what Derek was talking about, prompt, pay, uh, prompt payment legislation, sorry. We're not paying the contractor. And then we expect the contractor to continue doing the work out of pocket for months and still not paying them, even though the engineer may have recommended it. So these are typical disputes. Right. And um, like I said, in my experience, I've seen the cash flow as a major dispute. I've seen misinterpretation of the contract as a major dispute because how I interpret the contract may be different from how another person interprets the contract, but the contract language is clear. So perhaps what we need to do is go back to contract reviews. If we design a contract and we tailor it, then we probably need to have someone review it, just like design reviews. Uh, when I was at Trinder Planet, Adish, Adish would know this. We used, to, we used to do design reviews of others. It's a professional mature action. And they used to do also divine reviews of our designs and it, it brought up errors that we corrected and so on. So perhaps we need to do contract reviews as well. If I don't have thing I have to say before I answer the question or get to the question, sorry, is um, I know the attorney general spoke about um, in January about um, the challenges of the courts in terms of resourcing and so on as a challenge to the implementation of the act. So of course I'm no lawyer, so I'm not gonna speak on that. But what I'm gonna say is that there was some discussion on having a special arm of the court to deal with our construction disputes. Because as, as Derek would know himself, when it gets to the court, it takes months, sometimes years, and Adish talked about it. It takes months, sometimes years, and in the meantime, the, the, the contract goes nowhere. And during that time, when all this has been delayed in the courts, because of no fault of the courts, they have a lot of cases, prices are changing, escalating, changing, conditions are changing, and so the project gets invariably delayed or shelved. Now, let's answer the question. So, do you understand, based on your experience, is the type of contract upon projects a direct result of delayed projects as the penalty type of contract box vector, sorry, type of contract box vendors, contractors? In? I'm not sure if I'm the right person to answer that question because um, I'm not sure if I'm interpreting that question correct. Um, so, I will leave that for anyone else who wants to answer. But the part B, which is any experience when a dispute revolution would have aid to a contract change. Well, I think we should have some lessons learned. Um, if we've had disputes and contracts and we have the correct research, and I'm hoping that I interpret the question correctly, then it should inform the next contract that you do because invariably you learn from your past errors. But I am not sure if we have that sort of repository in Trinidad and Tobago. So this is why research is important. To have the students in research and then tie in the research to the industry for change. Otherwise, if our research is not being tied into industry, then all universities are becoming non-functional. And I hope that's not the case, right? So I'll answer that there, but the part, yeah, I think I, I could probably leave it to either Anish or um, Derek to, to answer that one. Derek, can I turn to you? Uh, and I would like to ask you as well. I've, I have experience, for example, of working on a pre-dispute board, such as the type that they had in the 2012 Olympics in the UK, whereby before anything goes for dispute, whether it's uh, the validity of a change order or something more formal, it has to go through this project-based uh, dispute review board, even before it goes to adjudication. Do you see merit in something like that? Is it something that you would welcome within the, uh, the contracts in, in Trinidad, and do you think that the appropriate forms of contract are being used? We mentioned before that there's a lot of amendments to it. Is it the amendments which are actually hog tying the industry rather than the contracts themselves? That's a, 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 a lot there, uh, John. And if I could start with your last point, because Don touched on it, that con there are contract conditions that are being written that are now transferring 100% of the risks of the employer onto the contractor. And that's not good for any industry because the employer here being the largest significant employer in the construction industry is the one who, who best can carry those risks. 
you don't pass the risks of the of 100% of the employers onto the contractor. Most standard forms of contract, as it is, try to balance the risk 50-50. So it's all right to move some of those risks, maybe at 10%, but not all 50%. And it is being done by the largest of state corporations at handling, you know, right? The largest of that uh, 90% of the construction works, you know, and, and they're doing this, passing 100% of the risk, no small, medium contracting company can carry those risks, none, none. And it's destroying the small and medium enterprise, which is the machine and the growth of our industry. When last you've heard a small, medium company has become, small, you know, become a medium sized company and then grow to a large company, you know, what are the large construction companies in Trinidad and Tobago? Basically two other than the foreigners. So is it that we're creating conditions of contract for the benefit of a select few? You know, and, and so when he talks about box contract, boxing the vendors and contractors, this is what we're talking about, conditions of contract that are unfair to the contractor. But you ask any lawyer and they say, if the, once you sign to that, your hands are tied, you know, so you made your bed, so you shall lie. The thing is that it's duress. This is how I see it. It is duress. If government controls 90% of the construction industry and a fella can't put in, but he need, to, he need to get some food, he need to be, he ha, you know, he, he has to sign. How is he gonna get work? This is the rest. And then the big, they pull out the big lawyers and they go quickly for, for senior counsel and whatnot and hit this poor little man on the head with a massive sledgehammer. This is completely unfair and it's happening, you know, in the industry. Now, I understand his part B and any sensible, person doing a construction job, and John, you would know this, in a developed country, before you decide what the form of procurement, contract procurement would be, I'm talking about the form of contract, you do what is called a construction procurement report that tells you the best route depending on if you want quality, if you want cost certainty, or you want schedule certainty. The, the contracts decide where the risks lie. The, con the contract document is the risk management plan. And you need to do a construction procurement report, courses for courses, but when you have a budget made, national budget made, and it is said by the, by the, the executive, we are going to use the PPP form of procurement you've actually slotted all the projects in the single form of procurement, whether it's suitable or not. But they, you know, so if, so because you need finance, you do this, the, the, the thing is that you, you have, there's an industry, we are professionals. You need to talk to us. You need to understand because I, I don't know if the people who sit on these boards, you know, of this special purpose company, and there are 38 of them, man. Eh? I could count the number of engineers on these boards on one hand. I would need 10 hands to count the amount of attorneys on these boards. Mm -hmm. They don't, they're not in construction. Why are the boards a proliferation of it if they're construction? If they're supposed to be there to do construction work, they should be engineers, architects, you know, surveyors, you know. If attorneys, by all means, attorneys who understand construction contract and only a few of them, right? It's a specialist issue. In England, they, said they have a whole court, the technology and construction court, because they understand that, you know, 
and the judges and so on, they could come from the industry. You know, the, the thing about it, and the chief justice mentioned it, don't touch on it. He's mentioned that, hey, if I have to implement this procurement law, I need a special commercial court alone because it's going to clog up the rest of my court system with the rest of the amount of challenges. And I'm saying, by all means, make it a construction and commercial court. Let's put the two things, the procurement and construction, in one court. We have court cases. We have court cases here that have started in 2015 that have no end. You know that have you know because it's construction now. Murder. It ain't gonna happen tomorrow. It has to. It ha it's in the queue, right? And then it's the wear it all as to whether anybody wants to resolve the the, the the matter or not. It's good to keep it going. It's good politics, you know. The question is, you know, these things are not fitting our industry. You know, offset it. We've said it. Offset three things he said in three of his recommendations. You know, two of the recommendations, recommendation number 75, right? In recommendation number 75, he talks about. Um, all state agency boards must be held responsible and accountable. All state agency boards must be held responsible and accountable for the planning and implementation of their projects. You know, right? This entails into area ensuring that all applicable rules, regulation, procedures, and laws are scrupulously Did we lose Derek, sir? I don't know. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you again now, Derek. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't know that any of these special purpose company boards, the 38 of them, that they, that they are carrying liability for the construction projects. You know, and he also said it in recommendation number 91, right? The HDC board must be held accountable for any deviations from the rules, regulations, procedures, and guidelines, and must be held responsible for ensuring that their projects are implemented within agreed time, cost, and quality standards. This was said, these two things are said since 2010, 13 years ago. And in, and in number 54, you know, recommendation number 54, he said there, there should be no doubt as there presently is as to the power of ministers to give instructions to government agency companies on any matter within the minister's remit, including compliance with rules, regulation, procedure. If this cannot be achieved by voluntary means, consideration should be given to creating an agency as a statutory corporation incorporating such powers. <clears throat> so I don't know if we spin in top in mud, but John, it means that since 2010 to now, and I know that the prime minister did set up some committee to look into the, 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 the implementation of these 91 recommendations of Professor Off and, to, and, to, and the, 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 the discussion that came out is they're all implemented. We don't have to talk about it anymore. And here we are today, 91 recommend. And let me tell you something here. Nobody's come to us in the industry. They just sit down and, 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 and in a little room by themselves and say, hey, Take this one off, take that one off, take that. Yeah, boy, we finish all. You know, and it's done. But it certainly doesn't appear to me out here in the industry, and nobody's come to me and come to the university, you know, and ask any one of us. You, you all have research on this, you all have data on that, you all know nothing like that, nothing like that. And so I can see why the gentleman asked the party and part B question. You know, because thank it's you, Derek. Yeah. 
I'd, I'd like to pass this across to Adesh now, just for a couple of minutes before we close. Uh, there are there are no other no other questions from the chat room. I do have one other, but I'd like to pose to Adesh. Adesh, you're in a position you're in a better position than probably Don or Derek to look at the way contracts are being drafted to go out to tender. Do you think that by the changes that are being made, there is a preferred selection of contractors? Do you think that the drafting of the contract is narrowing the industry at all? For, uh, forcing, forcing procurement to uh, a limited number of supply, proven tested suppliers, rather than those who should be perhaps afforded an opportunity? Um, well, from my personal experience right now, I, I don't think um, that is occurring in that um, I think all contractors are being given a fair opportunity to tender on the project um, with respect to the evaluation of the tenders. That is something that may be questionable in terms of how the, the state enterprises mm -hmm. are, are selecting the, 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 the sort of selecting the preferred, the preferred tender in terms of the, the, the criteria, are they giving too much, um, a greater weighting to financial than the technical part of the proposal that these contractors are submitting? And that, um, I, again, in a sense, um, certain contractors could cut their profit margin and still function. So in terms of their rates, would, would give them a, a greater, um, a greater weighting in the, in the overall tender evaluation. Um, so it, it is possible that, I think it's more the tender evaluation part of it rather than the, than the, than the condition of contract giving preference to the contractors. Um, everyone has the opportunity to, 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 to tend on it. Everyone has the opportunity to, to um, each contractor has, has the opportunity to, to, to build up his or her, well, their, well, their team with the appropriate skill set to, to give them a, a good, a good um, technical score but i think what what's happening is that the the financial the the, way, the financial proposed the financial um, aspect of the of the tenders being given a greater weighting rather than the technical than the technical um, part of the proposal uh, with consultants locally you tend to get probably the technical technical proposal from the consultant being given like 70, 60 or 70 percent weighting and the financial 30 percent whereas with the construction you get the, the technical probably being 30%, 40%, and the financial being 60%. Probably, as a, I think and I think that is where they, we may need to look back at, um, in terms of the procurement, what weighting is given for, for, for technical versus financial. Um, to me, you, you need to ensure that your, your contractor understands the project, has the appropriate people on board for, for executing the project, for managing it and, and executing it. And I think, I think we may need to look back at, at, at how we weight the tender evaluations for the construction contract. Um, what, um, what I also would like to see, I mean, and again, this is a personal experience is that in the tender evaluation that the, the, the employer has the consultant as part of the tender evaluation team. Um, again, if, if we don't have um, recommendation number two in the off report being, being um, follow where management roles should be performed only by experienced persons who should be motivated to take positive and proactive decisions. Um, you can get the 10 evaluations not being done properly and, and, and we give, we given, we awarding contracts to, to, to the, to the, to the wrong contractor, uh, which would result in, in, in mm -hmm. issues down, in issues down the road when you have to execute the contract, um, in terms of quality claims, those sorts of things. Um, uh, that's the, that's that's the way I, I I see it. Yeah, thank you. There is another point just come in uh, in the chat room from uh, Gayasi Ambrose, and we only have a couple of minutes now, and then I will have to pass back to Kamla. Uh, he says unable to speak at the moment. However, my main question is: Should we also consider program project management legislation, should, such as the PMIAA in the US or GPDF in the UK? which would guide how we select programs, projects, and those who are qualified to manage. 
having been lectured by Mr. Outridge at UE in the MSc Project Management Programme, reading and listening to Mr. Raymond and keeping abreast of the relevant documentation, such as the UF report, I'm of the belief that while procurement legislation is important, one area we are missing is that many of these projects should not even be undertaken or are poorly managed. Such a payment cash, uh, so we may need to look at those aspects to even avoid reaching the stage where dispute resolution is needed. I think I agree quite a lot with that. Uh, the UF report was insightful, and I think it, uh, I think it brought together all of the issues which Gayasi Ambrose speaks of there. But in 30 seconds, do any of you have any other comments on that? Do you think we do need a PMIAA or a GPDF? I see after Ribbon's hand is up, so I yes, uh, I've but, just uh, I've, I've just seen that. Yeah, but I would like to see a John. You know the fact that the <clears throat> ninety one recommendation have not yet been addressed. That some new initiative be taken to set up some organization committee or body to actually seriously address this, as you know what happened with Latham and Egan when. Nothing happened with the report for 12 years that the, the new report rethinking construction had to be done in, in order to address what was a previous commission of inquiry in which nothing was done. And I think we're there now, you know, 13 years later, we're in the same place as the UK. Thank you. Afra, would you like to come in? Three points to make. This has been an excellent seminar, and I want to thank colleagues for taking the time and putting out that kind of effort, okay? I've listened carefully, and there's three points I wanted to make here. I just proceed in what seems to me to be the correct order. The first point is the whole point about the state having the advantage in terms of size. Derek has outlined, you know, they say that size really does matter. Derek has outlined, way back in the 70s, how the proportion of work conducted by the state has risen till now it's virtually 90% within our, within our society, okay? Which is a figure I broadly agree with. And how we can make sense of that is to go back to the learning in the Bala report from March of 82. Because Lennox Bala, who was then the PS in charge of the Foreign Affairs Ministry, was asked by Prime Minister Chambers to do an examination of the government to government arrangements which were convulsing the country. <clears throat> and that request for the examination came out of Winston Riley's paper of October of 78. So Winston's paper convulsed the industry and Ch Ch Williams didn't do anything about it. But Chambers, when he came in, asked Bala to look at it. And one of the interesting findings in Bala is not being much spoken about because people are looking for controversy and bubble. One of the interesting findings in Bala is Bala makes a very piercing point that given the fact that we were acquiring so many contracts at once for goods, works, and services. We, as a country, the public interest in the country, we had a tremendous negotiating strength. We had a, a, a negotiating position of tremendous strength, and we never put it to work. Each contract was treated silo, 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 peace, 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 peace. And in every single contract, we had been advantaged. But the actual collective benefits of approaching it as a big portfolio of work, the country never did that. So that's actually a very piercing insight from the Knox Bala from March of 82. And it actually dovetails awkwardly. You see, it's not just the insight. What could we learn from it? It dovetails awkwardly with the point you all are making. I agree with your point that, in fact, the state enterprises have abused their position to take out the interest clause. And we all know about that, yes? And that has resulted in tremendous unfairness to the industry. And in fact, effectively, the industry is financing the country's development pro process, yes? Because the contractors have to hold straight away for the money. That has now, that, that unfairness has manifested. That, that size matters has manifested in that unfairness, the removal of the interest clause. The removal of the interest clause has had a tremendous impact on contractors. And contractors have e equally have to charge a price to compensate themselves for that. So in fact, the country has not benefited from the learning of Bala. But let us come forward a bit more in the story. So that's the 82 reference. 
2023 discussion. Let's come forward a little closer and you can recognize that the, that the, off, the off report, the 91 recommendations, and I'll say it very plainly, you all have been very coy and gentlemanly, they have not been implemented. Mrs. Prasad, Mrs. Sir, Dr. Rowley, they haven't been implemented. Dr. The committee, Dr. Rowley was supposed to set up, it was never set up. Mrs. Prasad, Mrs. Sir, had set up a construction oversight committee sort of thing. The meetings fell apart. That was under Jack Warner. I used to be part of JCC at the time. It didn't happen. Okay, the re recommendations have not been implemented. In 2013, I accused you, the court, about Invaders Bay of lying about the question about all of the recommendations have been implemented. Unicot was making that statement in a press release. And I said, that's not true. That's not true at all. And I gave the example of Invaders Bay where recommendation number 17 about consultation had been breached. They put out a full page of advertisement about me. I hit them with a letter to the editor the next week. Everybody got quiet. That time, Julian John was there. Now there's Noel Garcia there. I don't, I don't, it still haven't been implemented. And the last point I want to make, because Derek, you and um, Don made the point about four large state agencies that effectively drive the construction process in the whole country. And that would probably be HDC and NIPCO and UDCOT. And I forget who the fourth one is. Maybe it's EMBD. Okay, maybe I got the four right, four out of four. But anyway, so you've talked about four agencies that do those things. And I have a partner, and I don't know my partner to be a thief or anything so. He's older than me, he's a fellow I know for a long time, 25 years. He's an attorney, a respectable professional man. He's not any flag wave in PNM, but about five or six years ago, he was put on a board of one of those four companies. I wouldn't say which one, one of those four. And he used to come to the office and see me now and again and discuss things, the way you do in Trinidad, and chat and so on and so on. And one day talking with him, we were, we were wrangling on a point. It might have been about something. It was not a project in his agency. Something else was happening. We were wrangling on a point, back and forth. And I realized to my horror, it's like when your whole skin starts to scroll, I said to him, but Mike, do you mean to tell me a senior attorney like you, you're 20, over 25 years at the bar, a top professional man, don't you know any business, they live in the same house for 30 years. You have teeth, no money, no big car, nothing. You're on a state board now. And the board looking to you for guidance. You've never read the off report? You had never read it. So this could give you an explanation of what it is we're fighting with. We're fighting with a post-reading culture. People don't read. They don't want to read. They don't wish to be informed. This is what we're fighting with, eh? And you're not going to be able to, to, to take a target against the enemy unless you actually understand what the enemy is. Eh? And this part of mine, I said to him, that is nonsense. And I got my secretary to print out the whole of the report and I highlighted, you know, the 91 recommendations, I highlighted parts with tabs. And I give it to him and I said, and we, we used to talk, eh? We used to talk. And it's one of the biggest agencies with some huge controversial projects. And he went down there and he started to think. And about two weeks time, they removed him. He got a letter saying, and they thanked him for his services. It wasn't any scene. They didn't fire him. And he didn't wrote, they sent it to his house. And they thanked him for his services. Because he started to go in the meeting, informed, to say that number 56 of off says this. How does this relate to what we're doing here? Which is what I was trying to coach him. But so the struggle remains. I'm not going to stop. So, colleagues, you all have done a very good piece of work this evening, this afternoon, and I, that's all I'd like to say. It's not really a question. Thank you, Afra. I've actually just been reminded by camera that we, camera, that we do actually have until three thirty. My my mistake. My apologies on that. So, if there are any other questions, please come forward. Uh, looking back through the notes I made as we were going along today, this is a people industry. We need value for money. We need experience, but there is a reticence to come forward. How do we overcome that reticence? What are we going to do to make this a better industry? We've talked about different parts of the UF report, but let's talk, if we can, for a few minutes about the professional institutions. Let's revisit that. Who wants to kick off? Don, do you want to go first? How are the professional oh, sure. institutions? How are the professional <laughs> well, institutions going to in engage with academia to improve the industry? 
you know, it's very hard to, to follow a man like Afra, but I will try my best. <laughs> he, he's gone offline now. So I, I know, I, I saw that. <laughs> but I will say this, huh? what, he's, what he's talking about, what Derek has talked about, what has Adish has talked about, there's a simple solution. We don't need to find a solution, or we know the solution. And here's what the solution is. You see what he spoke about where his, his friend went into the board and started making recognitions and they removed him? Mm -hmm. This is part of a bigger problem in the industry. And I can talk from personal experience. I can tell you that many years ago, and this is, this is actually was the trigger for the PhD, so I'm just going to give you a story to answer that question. I was asked to we call swing, swing at an evaluation. In other words, I made a recommendation. And then they said, here's what, you need to change it to this person. And the person didn't have the equipment or anything. And my former boss started to persecute me in the organization. I had to get a lawyer involved and so on. And then I left the organization. But what happened after I left is that the organization became better. It takes a certain level of courage to stand up for what is right. So the question that they asked, John, which is, what do we need to do now? Because then if we don't figure out in this session what we need to do now, then this session has become a talk shop and we don't want to be a talk shop. What we need to be do now is that every person, uh, there are 34 persons in this session, I think, needs to go out there and say, here's what. This is right, this is wrong. Within we, we, the confines of the law and the regulations that you have to follow. And this is what we need to do to advocate even if it is at some point, sometimes take personal benefit, because I can tell you I've lived it. The industry, I, I, I think I've said this in other forums with uh, both Derek and Adish. If we continue not advocating for the procurement legislation for construction industry, we will have no industry. And if we have no industry, what will happen invariably is that the government will say, okay, we have no industry, so we need to bring in foreign contractors and we will have no industry. If we don't have any industry, there is no data to generate for research. So the university uh, faculties of engineering in both UTT and UE will shut down because we have no industry. They depend on the industry for students. As Derek talked about also, the satellite industries that go along with this industry, the, the, the next energy the construction industry is a big economy driver. So you will have, your economy will not flourish. Energy can't be the sustainer forever. That is one of the economy drivers, but there's, there's another one, which is construction. So what do we need to do now? We need to get institutions like CCGI, which are already doing it. We need to get institutions like, and I'm gonna say Bullface here, as they say, APET, um, Contractor Association, I know they did some advocacy. We need to get them to come together in the JCC to actively tell the government of the day, whether it's this government or the next, or whoever it is, we need to stand up and say, this is what we need to do to correct the situation. Because you think about what is the potential for the money we lost in corruption in the last 30 years, and how much that could have been done to fix our hospital and so on. Some people say I'm going political, but this is the truth. This is the truth of the matter. I always tell people all this all the time, project management is not the management of projects, project management is the management of people. So if you're going to manage people, and in this generation coming, we need to save the whole industry by influencing and advocating. That is what we need to do in my respectful view to correct the situation. And if we can't stand up as an industry and do that together, and we advocate in every forum, we keep on advocating, advocating, Right? When I, I just want to say this last thing because I know I want to be respectful to give Derek and Adesha a final uh, viewpoint as well. When I started advocating in November, oh sorry, I think it was September, I remember how the social media comments used to go, um, a very funny acronym, somebody say, hey, just Don Samuel, PhD means pothole doctor. I thought it was quite funny, right? <laughs> I actually like that acronym. So, but now if you watch the comments, it has changed. And now the minister, and I'm not taking this by myself, Derek has advocated, so has Adesh, so as many others, Construction Management Institute. So when we started advocating, people were laughing. Now people are getting serious. Now the ministers um, are also listening. in. But we have to keep it going. You have to keep on advocating and advocating until we get the change. 
And we already know the solutions to all our problems. We just need to implement it and ensure that it's implemented. So that will be my final comment there. Um, respectful of the time there, John. Thank you indeed, Don. Uh, Derek, people need to speak up more. Do they need more protection when they're speaking up? Yes, I, I agree, but I, I don't know how to give them it. You know, I, I can tell you that um, Off did, did make certain um, pronouncements. There were about 11 of the 91 recommendations. The action item is that government needs to have its own form of contract. Similar to like what you have in the, in the UK, the government um, works contract, you know, if they, if, if they want to look at, at, at and say for the industry to take certain risk and the industry should have, should be participating in the development of any government works contract. You know, and, and, and that is missing. It hasn't happened since, since 2010. With, I don't know any committee or anything that, that is drafting a government works contract for both building and civil engineering, engineering works. You know, and um, after the, they talk about some tender rules and, and, and so forth, yes, of, of they make some recommendations for, for standard tender rules to be drafted. And that was supposed to happen with the procurement legislation. It, it, it hasn't been proclaimed, you know. And there was very little, um, um, of did speak of corruption, you know, in, in, in about uh, eight of the, the, the conditions. Um, I've had two pieces of research done by master's students on irregularities and corruption. None of them wanted to publish the work for fear of victimization. But it's a, quite an eye opener when you when you understand when you when 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 you understand the the level of corruption that is in our construction industry. And that that I, I can't go into that today. That has to be it, it be something else. But it's. It, it, it's unbelievable the percentage in which um, contractors, you know, and other participants in the industry have said that they have actually <clears throat> done um, corrupt things. You know, this 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 comes up because of the protection of the anonymous aspect of the of the questionnaires and so forth. But it's you know we listen, John. We've addressed the off. Commission of Inquiry in academia, you know, you know, I, we have, we have about 400 project managers that pass through that course. The course work, the, the course requires a, a, a cooperation between the industry and, and, and academia in order to get its accreditation. And so practitioners are well aware of what we do, you know, from the professional organization, because it's members of the professional organizations that attend, and, and, and I mean people who sit on the boards of these professional organizations, not the ordinary members, who attend, participate in the examination process, participate in um, examining um, theses, you know, participate in recommending improvements of the curriculum and in, in the course, you know, Right, all of the students are taught ethics and morality, right up from BSc all the way, all the engineering students that we have in the civil and environmental uh, department, they go out there with that, you know, right? It's it's not that they they don't know it. So I so so there's no to say that you know the academia and the uh, and the profession are apart, though they're not, the profession knows exactly what we're doing in academia, yeah. right? And, and, but the thing is, there is no will, you know, there's no will because like I say, if you have a monopoly, why would you change that? If I could dictate how things are to be done and, and I must be the master in dictating it, then why would I give up that power? And I, I, I'd stop there. Thank you. Yeah, um, Adesh, I'm going to make you the president of the JCC for the next 
two minutes, how are you going to change the industry? Are you going to use social media as a platform? Are you going to use government lobbying as a platform? How are you going to get over this reluctance to speak because of the fear of re the fear of potential replies or mockery or whatever you wish to call it? Well, let me let me give you a personal experience I have. My wife is a, also a civil engineer and she worked for a state enterprise. And in that state enterprise, she observed some irregular practices and she, she spoke out about it. Um, and she actually went to the anti-corruption squad and gave evidence about what she observed. And um, she ended up getting terminated from a from, from her from a from a job. She called me a morning and said, hey, after come pick me up, the, uh, the uh, armed security guard escorted her out of the building. And my wife was like just over five feet tall. What, what do you need an armed security guard to take out the building for? But it's because she basically spoke out. And I mean, we looked at this whistleblower protection act. It's still in the bill stage. It hasn't been proclaimed yet. I mean, we're basically sitting down on that. There's, why, if, you, if we actually get this whistleblower protection act proclaimed, by the president and, and, it, and it becomes law, then people will have some level of protection and they may, and they may speak out. I mean, when, I mean, Mr. Outridge had indicated that um, there's a, a force in you on ethics and morality. I, I, I mean, I, right now, I'm beating my, my brains out to see did I have any kind of course like that when I was in university in the early 90s. And I, I, I really can't recall. It's good, that, it's good that, that there's a course on that. But what is a bit disappointing is that when I see, when I read about um, what's going on in some of these state enterprises and the corruption and who is involved, and you see these young engineers, I'm a bit disappointed. And, and, and why is it they're getting involved in that? Is it, is it they're just succumbing to the, to the pressure from their, from their superiors? And, and, and that if they speak out, if they, or if, they, or if they say, well, no, I'm not signing that, that, that payment certificate, they, 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 they have to pay for the job and, or pay for, uh, as um, I think Don was saying, he, 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 some sort of, um, retaliation from your supervisor. So I think one of the first things on the GCC, I would push for to get this whistleblower protection act proclaimed. But is it still in the bill stage? I mean, I think it's 2022. So as of the last year, this, this, this thing has is, is, is been is being discussed, but we, have, we haven't moved forward. It hasn't become, hasn't become law. So we need, that's one thing we need to get. Um, in, to, uh, in terms of, um, like, again, yeah, it comes back to the government lobbying, get this, get this whistleblower protection act um, I guess it let become law and, and, and let people who observe these irregularities in procurement or uh, procurement or execution let them have let them not fear for the job if they speak out it was it, it, again when when we have these things in place the people who would would, would tend to want to um, do the, the, the incorrect things the follow the incorrect or do their own thing and not follow the, 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 the established procedures they 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 will they, they they will know that um that that there, there is some some repercussion for their actions and it comes back to uh, again accountability as it is if as president jc said push for ensuring that these key performance indicators on state enterprises are uh, has been implemented let them, they, they need to they need to they need these boards need to be held accountable for for for, for um in terms of how they they they're spending the, the taxpayers the taxpayers fund um, accountability. I think. I think. Um, Mr. Outridge kind of went all out. Well, all out on accountability. I think that's something that we need to get um, established in the industry from from the I say from the employer, the consultant, the contractors. Everybody has to be accountable for the actions. I mean, so again, that's something again I I would want to push for. Um, I think. Uh, what else would we push for? Uh, in terms of G in the first, the president of JCC, I, I, I need to make sure in terms of quality, um, we need we need to and it comes back to the um, to the recommendation number two. Management role should be for my only experienced persons. Should be for my experienced persons. Let me give let me give a simple simple uh, example of, of if if you don't know how 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 you can be taken advantage of something like concrete. We 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 have a lot of work where, we, where we're doing concrete work. Um, and yet when you're taking a concrete sample, you can take either, I mean, if, it, if you're following European or British codes, it's cube samples, typically if it's the American, the American codes, um, it's our IBC, um, ICI, cylinder, cylinders. You do, for the same 
class of concrete. If you do, a, if you test a cube sample and a cylindrical sample, the cube sample will give a higher compressor strength. I have seen, again, I have seen in a state where state and the private was managing a construction project being done under the the the, 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 the yellow book. I mean, that, that's where the contractor responsible for design. The contractor indicated what his design. His design codes that he here follows the American code of practice, and he indicated that the concrete strength was supposed to be um, 30 megapascals at 20 days. And yet, and yet if, if, it's the, if it's the American Concrete Institute, um, ACI 318 or whatever code of practice, he followed for reinforced concrete. It's supposed to be taken out cylindrical samples. Yet he took cube samples, submitted those results to the, to, to the, to the employer because the employer was basically um, overseen or had had. Was kind of overseeing the construction and, and the concrete the cube the cube trench was 30, but really it was a cylinder being taken. That would be below 30, 30 megapascals. And we accept mm -hmm. and, and they accepted that. And this is an educational institute that was being constructed. And the, again, we need to ensure that we the management roles are again at the employer, the the, the consultant and the contractor that we have the experienced persons and at the JCC, we I, I would push for our our, the, the, the professional organizations within our within the JCC to, to hold workshops for their own members to, 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 to disseminate information which would make them better equipped to execute their, 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 their projects. That's something again, I, I would push for. Um, I think that's about it in terms of what I, what I could think to off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure whether when, 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 when you take back over, I'll probably have another, some more things to say, but off the top of my head that's basically what i what i would kind of push for right now i think you've just uh, presented an excellent platform for being the next uh, leader of the jcc uh, i would like to pass across to don and I'll, I'll make this the last one before closing don what support do you need as an industry lobbyist for want of a better word to get the message across to the public, to make the industry listen to the to your message. Uh, did you hear the question, Don? Uh, you're still on mute. <laughs> oh, I, I took a break and he's in there, so I have to. After hear a repeat of the question. Sorry about that. Done? No worry. No worry. Uh, my question was, as an industry lobbyist, what support do you need to make the, the populace understand the importance of changing, making change in the industry as recommended by uh, the UF report? And how are you going to do it? What, what support do you need? How are you going to get this message across? Ah, great question. Um, I think the first thing we need to do is have some sort of education drive. And so at least sessions like this would help, but who is it reaching? Um, as I said before, I saw 32, 36 people in this session today. That's good. But how do we redo, how do we reach a wider population? I mean, I, I don't want to put Carmen on his foot by saying, well, do we share this, this video? I mean, it's a nation building video. And as I say in the video, nation building seminar, sorry. Um, but I'll leave it up to that prerogative for the CCGI. But in terms of support, I think the industry needs to stand up behind advocates. Not just myself, um, Adish, Derek, Afra. Um, I'm horrified a little bit by Adish's story that but I didn't know because I know Adish, I know his wife, and I'm horrified that she stood up and she was victimized. And if I were to share a story now, which I wouldn't, I understand exactly what she went through, <laughs> right? So this is not funny. We can't have people being victimized. And then here's what they do. Eh? When you advocate, what do they do? Do they stay in the country? No, they leave the country. Now you have a brain drain of your, of your bright and intelligent people. So that's one. What support do I need? What, what we all need? We need the industry. And I'm going to put it a little bit raw like Afro. We need to stop looking at egos. We need to stop looking at whether Don 
He's a clown. <laughs> we need to stop looking at all these things. You don't have to like me. But we need to come to a common position as to why are we all seeing what we see. Some people, will, we are so polarized in this country right now that we can't see past the political state of the day. We need to mature as a people and say, hey, this is not right for a country. Whether what political party you come from, nobody enjoys driving on roads to potholes. I can guarantee you that. No one. So we need to stand up and say, this is what we need for the country. Nobody enjoys, for example, not getting water when they come. Procurement, governance, which CCGI is also advocating for, affects every single facet in this country. It affects everything, the acquisition of all goods, infrastructure, and so on. So what support do we need? We need to educate the public. So we don't need to educate what you call the technical people, know, because the technical people in this session, they understand everything we say. We need to go out there and find a way to bridge it to the people who so are not technical. How do we reach the man on the street and say, listen, man, we are the experts, you are the armchair expert. How do we, and, and that is a serious thing because you saw it during COVID, where the armchair experts were influencers in the society as compared to the actual experts. This is another challenge that we have. How do we convince persons to listen to experts like Derek, Adish, Afra, John Dows, Kamala, whoever, or, or, or all the persons in this Zoom room? Because that is something you're going to wrestle with. You're going to wrestle with so. So how do we now use social media to advocate? So the support I would need as a lobbyist, and I see Darren is agreeing with me in the chat. Um, the, support I, uh, the support I would need as a lobbyist is we need to get the industry behind us and force the government. And I don't know if you could do it in respectful, a uh, respectful way. We don't need to quarrel and you know <laughs> go and protest, but maybe I don't know if that is where it will come to. We need to advocate for the government, stop treating us like and any government, eh? and I say that openly, any government, stop treating us like idiots and understand, we understand the situation. Listen to your experts. I don't know everything, sorry, I don't know anything much about the geotechnical side of engineering. That is added strength. Direct strength is contracting, quantity surveying, and plenty of others, which if I, if I call it up, we'll be here until four o'clock. Uh, so we need to respect that. And, and lastly, what we need to do is make ensure that we have the right people in the right positions, making the right decision at the right time. I'll close with that. Well, I would like to say thank you to the participants today, to Adesh, to Don, to Derek. I think the discussions have been insightful, probing, necessary even. Uh, I would also like to thank Kamla and the CCGI for the opportunity of moderating this. And I do sincerely hope that those from the industry who have been listening today will take on board the comments of the panelists and those who've participated by asking questions and that together we can learn from that, that we can move forward and develop a better industry, a better economy, and a better country overall. Kamla, thank you again, and back to you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Adish. This really was a very, very good uh, panel discussion. Um, so I thank you all for being so candid, so honest, for sharing of your years of experience, of your thoughts, because I agree with you, Don, it's all about nation building. We are here trying to help build a better society. And I'm so grateful to all of you who have taken your time to be here with us and to prepare for this uh, meeting. I wanna say thank you to the participants as well. It's wonderful to see that persons logged in from as early as 12.30 and Almost everyone has stayed the course. It, it demonstrates that, you know, there is great interest and there's a great commitment to wanting to see improvement in the sector. Um, I want to remind persons, please, it's, it is important we get your feedback. So please make sure you click on the link. I know many of you have enjoyed the session. 
do tell us that formally because that is the data and evidence that's important. We, we, we don't just want anecdotal information. It's important that we work with, with evidence in many respects. So please make sure you click on the link and give us your feedback as well. Um, we are all here trying to do the, the best that we can to help build um, a better society. So I appreciate the contribution of everyone. So again, sincerely thank you, John. And, and I apologize for giving you my cough. <laughs> uh, many, many thanks to you, Mr. Derek Aldridge. Sincerely, thank you, Dr. Don Samuel. Appreciate it. And Mr. Adish uh, Surajnat. Excellent, excellent work that all of you have done today. So um, I, I wish you all a, a wonderful evening. Um, I invite everyone to stay connected with us. Join us. Here at, at CCGI, um, I, I see Mr. Surajnat may very well become JCC president as well. So all these organizations also have very important roles, but we definitely here at the Governance Institute are playing our part to help bring people together, push the conversation forward so that we are all trying to ensure that we build a better nation for all of us. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat>